and this week we're going to be diving into the chronic challenge. We're going to be navigating chronic Lyme disease and other tick-borne co-infections with effective treatments. So whether it's mastering tick bite prevention, acute symptom recognition, or conquering chronic challenges, we're going to be tackling it head on. You're not just watching a class, you're stepping into a community that's ready to rise above Lyme disease. And hey, if you love diving into these life-changing topics, smash that subscribe button and turn on those bell notifications, and let's make Lyme disease awareness echo across the globe. So grab your notes, ignite your enthusiasm, and let's roll. Are you ready? Let's dive right in. Really excited that we're all here together for Lyme Awareness Month. This is week three of our five-part mini-series in learning all the complexities of Lyme and learning how to overcome all of that. I'm really, really excited that so many people have chosen to join us. Can't thank you enough. Um, and again, like a big, a big thank you to everybody for understanding a couple weeks ago when I had to uh, postpone one week. Uh, mom was in the hospital. She's been out and uh, in a rehab doing very, very well, getting ready to go back out on her own. So um, got lots of well wishes. Really, really, really appreciate that. And um, so thank you guys so very much. Uh, the other thing is, why don't you jump in the chat, let everybody know where you're calling in from, zooming in from. It's always nice to know where we're all connecting from. I know we've got people all over the United States and Canada. We've got some people from Europe who are primarily watching the replay because it's in the middle of the night right now. Uh, but it looks like we've got Virginia. Uh, we've got Brooklyn, New York. We've got Minnesota already. So thanks so very much. Houston, oh, Ontario, Canada. Lots of friends there. Kentucky, Virginia Beach, Austin. All right. Um, so great. We've even got Ottawa. Um, so Cincinnati, Detroit, great to see you guys. Missouri. Um, so happy to see everybody. Um, this is really exciting. One of the things that's happened since our last call that was like totally blew me over the moon and really helps us with our Lyme mission and getting things, you know, moving along so that people can really learn about the complexities. And we'll talk about some of these because a lot of things came up uh, in the news in the last couple of days. A lot of people I've been talking to, including some people I've seen already uh, popping into the chat here. Um, we've been talking about sort of the, the lack of people understanding the complexities of Lyme, the potential for chronicity. And they're really just saying, oh, the labs aren't good. The te you know, people are making this up. And, you know, that's not actually true. Uh, there's a lot of evidence supporting chronic Lyme. In fact, there's more evidence supporting chronicity of Lyme than cure. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, um, Note that every single person who gets bitten by a tick has that. And we talked about that in week one where, you know, it's but it's probably about 15 to 20 percent of people who get Lyme who are going to end up potentially with chronic symptoms. And what's so important about this is, you know, people are saying, hey, 80 percent of people get better with a short course of treatment. And then they don't say anything about the group over here. And then the group over here is saying everybody gets chronic Lyme, but it's probably not true. So the really the the take home message is that. We don't know enough information right now, but what we do know is that patients are suffering. We know that doctors and researchers and nonprofit organizations have seen this pandemic, essentially. It's an epidemic, right? This is such a big deal. And so one of the things is we just need to get the word out and we need to have more polite and professional discord, which includes not agreeing with each other, but still moving forward to figure out those next steps, right? And so I think it's important because the more we talk about our emotions behind it, the more we talk about the science behind it and we wed it all together and we have a professional discourse, we, we can have a conversation and learn new things and move forward so that each and every one of you has access to improved healing and a better chance, right? We really don't want to have chronic Lyme disease. So, but the problem is whether or not you say it's not here, or you, you say it is, it doesn't matter, it is, and we need to learn about that. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, really these cutting-edge treatments. But one of the things that happened last time is our YouTube channel doubled in size just by everybody being so nice to go over there and subscribe. And one of the key benefits of this, before we dive into everything for this evening and all the learning, is that this helps us get this free information out in front of people who really need it. And I had a really beautiful comment in the YouTube uh, replay uh, today that was like, hey, I can't, I might not be able to afford the treatment for that, you know, that you're charging or some of the other physicians are charging, 
but people are out there suffering. And I'm like, I know this, right? So I'm out there training other physicians and other healthcare practitioners. I'm also making sure that we get more and more and more free information out there for both the public and patients, as well as practitioners, so that th we have more people understanding this epidemic and we have more people who are open to actually helping you. And that's really the most important thing. So one of the requests that I have so that we can take our channel to the next level so that we can get to this place where we're reaching more people um, is that if you're technical, technologically inclined and you're okay with it, we are live streaming right now directly to YouTube. And the reason we're doing that is because when we get enough watch hours, they put us in front of more people. And when they put us in front of enough people and we get a few more thousand subscribers, I'm actually planning to apply to be one of the YouTube, um, you know, certified, if you will, health channels. And what that means is that they're going to look at what we're doing and they're going to say, hey, this is like craziness or this is legitimate. And as you know, I want to tell you guys all the science and when we don't have science and we're looking at the art of medicine I like to call that out because there's so much science behind what we're doing. And the more people we can reach and the more we can validate this for the general public, the more we can get away from what the naysayers are saying. We can start to change the conversation. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat. If you're feeling up to it and you want to join us over there on YouTube, that will help throw up our watch hours. It's the exact same thing. It's about a 10 second delay. It'll be the exact same piece. And I really appreciate that because this is this takes a village to get out there, right? Um, we didn't realize we needed to do that or we'd have done the whole thing live on YouTube before. But it's so important because we need to reach people and we need to legitimize the fact that people are actually suffering and there's science supporting that and there's science behind the chronicity. And I'm going to show you a lot of the science tonight about how to treat chronic Lyme because we spent and we and let's see, I'm going to scooch over to while we while I keep talking about that. And one of the things we really need to start thinking about is that, you know, um, whoop, there you go. We're on YouTube live. There's our challenge. We already talked about that. Forgot we had a slide, so it's all good. Um, again, just a quickie. Um, this is just for information and educational purposes. It's not a substitute for seeing a doctor or another healthcare practitioner. I even see some of them on the call with us today um, who are you know, in the program, learning how to do this for you. And it's, I just think it's so important that we can all work on this together. And so I'm going to just make that a little bit bigger in there. And then the next part that we really want to look at is we came from tick bite tactics and we went to beyond the bite. So we looked at prevention. We looked at what to do if we got bitten by a tick, how we can prevent Lyme if we got bit. And then also what about acute Lyme? But you know, as many, many of you know, one of the biggest things we have going on right now is that chronic Lyme is a thing, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So I really appreciate all the support. As I've mentioned, we're going to definitely um, be looking over there at the um, at all the chats on YouTube. I'm going to give a little preference to getting those answered, um, you know, and but at the same time, um, one of the things is we're going to get to everybody just like we do uh, every time. So, and as a reminder, Cutting Edge Treatment is coming up, uh, part two, essentially, next week. And then on June 6th, we're going to be talking Breaking Free. We're going to do a live healing uh, um, session, and I can't wait for that. So, let's talk about chronic Lyme disease uh, and where sort of our training starts and what we know and what we don't know. And the first thing is, most of the, there, there are multiple different treatment viewpoints, right? And one of those treatment viewpoints is, hey, Lyme's, you know, e kind of hard to get, kind of easy to treat. We can treat it with doxycycline or, you know, which is an intracellular antibiotic. We can treat it with cefuroxime or amoxicillin, these so-called cell wall agents. We usually are going to treat for 10 or 14 days, maybe 21 days, but really almost everybody only needs to have a short course of therapy. Now, when we go and we look at other people, um, we say, hey, um, does that work? Well, let's go back to that, what I was saying, that evidence-based medicine, right? The important part about the evidence is that we don't have really good evidence of, of cure. In fact, 
the best evidence we have is through Monica Ember's lab at Tulane. She did a thing, both four and six month infection of rhesus macaque monkeys. And in this case, it was six months. They treated them with doxycycline for 28 days and they cured a whopping 0%. Okay, so if we just go back for one second, I just said the standard course of treatment is up to 21 days. But if we treated you for 28 days, it may cure zero. And if I gave you 28 days of IV ceftriaxone, which almost nobody gets in acute Lyme unless you have like a huge swollen knee of a Bell's palsy or a heart problem, you know, or an eye problem, you're not going to get that. But if we did, and then we give you another two months of doxycycline orally, we cure 27% of these monkeys, right? This is abysmal. Now, with that said, we have to remember... Um, that what happened in this situation was they infected them for uh, six months and then it was repeated and they did it in a shorter period of four. But looking at this paper, we don't know what happens between, between the time someone gets infected and six months, but most people who are presenting with Lyme aren't getting diagnosed really early. If you get the rash, you find the, the tick, you have early, early symptoms, that's great. A lot of people aren't. So we need more research on what happens earlier on in infection, but we also have to recognize that this is three months, including a month of IV antibiotic, and there was not, that 25% is terrible, right? And they repeated this, right? And this is a really interesting paper, and we go deep into this in the Lyme Disease Practitioner Certification Program where I break down both the direct and the indirect measures. But one of the most important parts here is that the results that they found showed that each host, each individual primate, showed infection differently. And, they, and whether it was DNA, direct method, or it, through a biopsy, or it was an antibody response, it was completely variable, right? So the antibodies could be low, then you treat them and they go high. They could never make an antibody response no matter what. They could have high levels of some antibodies that go down with treatment. Other ones would stay the same or go higher. It was like literally all over the place. And then, so what they said was persistence was not reflected by maintenance of a particular antibody. So we're all looking for the, you know, which antibody, which band, you know, which style of ELISA test is going to get it right. The problem is it's variable. It's variable over time. It's variable between hosts. And the evidence, they found evidence of persistent, intact, metabolically active Borrelia burgdorferi that spirochete bacteria that causes Lyme disease after antibiotic treatment. Now, they point out, and that's what the last part is, disseminated infection. That's because they, let, they did this um, for a period of time and let, let them get between, past that early stage. So again, we're still missing what do we do before four months, but um, four months isn't that far out from when a lot of people are diagnosed and a lot are even after that. And we know that our lab tests do not necessarily show that these things are there because ultimately when you have the entire organism, meaning the monkey, where we can take all the organs out and culture and find these things, unfortunately then the animal is no longer alive, but we can prove that Lyme is still there even when our standard testing can't pick it up. So the question a lot of people always ask is like, well, why, how is this possible? Why is this, right? Well, one thing is we know that Borrelia, the genus of the spirochetes, have been found in ticks that are preserved in amber that are over 15 million years old. And then the ice man uh, was found to have Lyme disease. He's the oldest known human infection 5,300 years ago. So there's a lot of people out there talking about conspiracy theories, Plum Island Lab 257, all this stuff. That stuff may happen. But the reality is these organisms have been around longer than humans. They know how to survive. They're very advanced. And their advancements are not like better tests or instead of a CT, I'm doing an MRI or instead of an MRI, I'm doing some new special fandangled thing. It's not more tech. It's not more advanced. It's almost like being smarter by chilling, right? They hide. They play dead, you know, all kinds of cool stuff, right? And we're going to dive into the different persister forms because you need to know about that because a well, we have another treatment viewpoint, not just that standard one, right? And it says you might need to target the organism with multiple antibiotics, we might want to target its cell wall. We might want to target inside of cells. We also, 
have to take into consideration that these different agents are actually, um, they actually uh, work in different areas of your body. So not only are they working on different parts of the organism, the, the Borrelia burgdorferi, but they're working in a different part of your body. So we have to think about that. We may need longer durations of treatment. You may need to be treated more than once or for that, like I said, that extended period of time. And the other thing is people who treat a lot of chronicity understand there may be a role for natural treatment. And we're going to really dive into that. We touched on it a little bit with um, prophylaxis and acute treatment, right? There are herbs out there we know work, but where we know the herbs work the most are in these persister forms. So if we take a peek here, we're going to look here a little bit at Borrelia burgdorferi, right? The spiral bacteria. And it has a cell wall and it has an intracellular compartment, right? So there's an outside that you have to go through to get into it. And then there's, a pl in, there's some innards, just like our skin. So they have antibiotics that work on the skin. We have other ones that work internally. So we have to think about that. When we train a lot of doctors, we give them this list. We go, hey, there's a lot of different antibiotics out there that people talk about. You need to know where they act. And so this is sort of a list of the more commonly used medications and some of them are actually not that commonly used but we have but they're ones that are on the on the table so to speak so we have to make sure that we're you know we know where they work so that we can come up with a comprehensive treatment approach so with most of those antibiotics it's amazing that some of the best results are found at standard dosing the exceptions to that are typically azithromycin and amoxicillin. Now we don't necessarily have to go over the top with the dosing, but we stay at the higher end of the dosage range, right? And some like azithromycin is often done 500 milligrams for a typical adult on day one, and then 250 milligrams. A lot of the dosing we like to say is that get that 500 milligrams total in one day, you know, and it's to keep the levels higher. So they're penetrating and working well. You know, um, if we use amoxicillin, you can use amoxicillin by itself in some higher doses. You can combine it with other medications like probenicid that'll help it stick around longer. Um, so it's kind of analogous to having a higher dose, right? And so this can be really important, but there are some protocols that we're going to talk about next time where we're going to probably push the doses that most people are, are comfortable with, or at least used to. But the bottom line is, most people don't need to go there, right? So when we look at what we know about Lyme disease and we know about how we get these sort of, um, you know, how, how we get to chronic Lyme, um, we had a study come out in 2019 that I would love to see more research done because it's small, it was done on mice, but Dr. Zhang's lab at Johns Hopkins found what they were calling type 1 and type 2 late Lyme disease. And what they did was a study, and they used Lyme arthritis to allow us to understand disseminated or late disease, which is typically what people are talking about when we have chronic Lyme disease, because you've had it for so long, it's now affecting multiple organ systems and going throughout your body. So Lyme arthritis is one of the classic symptoms of uh, late Lyme, you know, the diagnosis wasn't made early for whatever reason. And you see destruction of the joint. So what they did is they infected ticks artificially. Then they gave the tick, they let the tick um, feed on the mouse. And they, what they found was somewhere right around 80% of those that were untreated got late Lyme disease or disseminated Lyme the way you would expect. It took a long time, six, eight months, um, at least the mouse equivalent of human six or eight months before the arthritis developed. But there was about 20%, just shy of 20% of these mice that developed what they termed early late Lyme disease. And early late Lyme disease is essentially saying, hey, you got Lyme arthritis very quickly after a bite. And what they, they were questioning why that happened. And when they looked, the spirochete causing Lyme was developing persister forms in the tick and the tick was inoculating the mouse with these persister forms. So essentially, uh, in other words, there's a possibility of getting chronic Lyme at the time of tick bite. Now, we don't have to go on and get all crazy about this. What we need to do is follow up on this and figure out, you know, is this just this one, uh, the setting in the lab, the particular, you know, ticks and, and or the mice or whatever. 
you know, the temperature was off in the room. We have to evaluate it more because what you'll see a little bit later on is we have one study that says one thing. We have another study that shows something else. But to me, when I say, hey, the CDC says about 80% of people get cured with a standard course of antibiotics. And then there's crickets for the other 20%. And then when I showed you a couple of weeks ago, 75% of people are better from acute Lyme with treatment of 10 to 21 days within six months of treatment. But there was a, about 25% that were six, six months to 10 years later. These numbers are starting to match up as we get more research. And I think that this is really important. We don't know all the answers, but what we do know is there's a lot of research supporting chronicity, potential chronicity of infection. And so this is a place we need to continue to look further. We need to continue to let legislators know this, um, the CDC, even people like the Global Lyme Alliance who funds a lot of this. We need to send them a couple bucks. We need to send them an email and say, thank you. Thank you for promoting this. You could even hop over on our playlist on YouTube and look at the podcast and like it, like our uh, video with uh, uh, Chukri Ben Mamoon because Tim Salati, who's the chief science officer at Global Lyme Alliance, is on there too because they're helping to support a lot of this research. But let's share the love and let's also share the research with everyone we can. Because some of these persisters we call round or are technically round bodies. Some people call them cysts. We typically use them interchangeably. But here's your spirochete, right? And then we know if we start to irritate it, like we're trying to kill it with an antibiotic or an herb or your immune system and a whole bunch of other things, it'll start to roll up. And essentially it rolls up into a ball, kind of like an armadillo. So the problem with this is that the cyst form is resistant to the vast majority of the antibiotics we would use for Lyme. And we would need to use, you know, other medications, including things like tinidazole and metronidazole. So you can't, the problem is it, we know from, from Petri dish and test tube studies, if we drop antibiotic on these things, it'll kill some, but a whole bunch of them will go into this form. And they've studied this and approximately every three weeks, they'll open back up and start to come back out to a swimming live mobile metabolically active spirochete that can make you sick. Now the other challenge with that is these have been shown to live in the test tube in the cyst form after the antibiotic has been removed because they put the antibiotic in and then they wash it out and just keep these in a growth medium. And they have had cysts that are round, you know, in that little round body for over 10 months that have then opened up and gone back. Some people are like, hey, how do I know I don't have Lyme? Like, I've been asymptomatic for six months. I'm like, that's really good, but keep, keep an eye out. You know, I wouldn't worry about having it if you're that good because usually it's earlier. But, you know, once you're at about a year uh, without symptoms, we're feeling better. Once you're two or three years or like me, 12 years, then you're like going, I'm good. But these things have been shown. This is published information. The papers are at the bottom and there's even other ones. So know that this there is evidence that these things will happen when you try to treat. We literally directly put antibiotic on these and most of it rolls into a ball and protects itself. This is science that's published, right? This is not us making up stuff. This is literally published in the medical literature. So when people are telling us it's not true, they should go look. So now if we look here, we've got on the left, we've got our spirochete and its cell wall and its innards. On the right, we've got another beautiful picture of that cyst or round body form. But we have another, and when we look at those, these are some of the medications that have been proposed to work on the cyst form, right? So I said metronidazole and tinidazole. Uh, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil kind of got more well-known during COVID. The challenge with it is one study showed it worked really well against the round body form getting rid of it. Another, another study showed it created a lot of it. Some people I talked to said, well, either way, it's good because it's either killing it or it's rounding it up into the to cyst form and then we can go after it. Tigacycline and daptomycin or IV, certainly much more challenging to use and haven't really panned out to be as helpful as we may have thought, but in the right time and place and the right person, um, those could be useful as well. Then we go to another big player in the field of um, persisters, right? And these are biofilms. And this is from Dr. Shappy's work. You see a bunch of spirochetes hanging out together. 
and that was two days at four days it got more and six days there was more and on and on through 21 days you have this mat right and the thing that's so interesting about these go back for a sec uh, is that not only are they spreading out in this like what they call biofilm microcolony, but they're also they've got kind of a top down top to bottom type of thing so they've got some depth to them as well um, again this is all microscopic you're not going to see this if in your body uh, but without a microscope but these things are real and they're hanging out together there's evidence of polymicrobial meaning more than one pathogen in different biofilms like one on top of the other and what's interesting is biofilm requires somewhere in most studies somewhere between 200 and 500 times a standard antibiotic dose to go through i've seen some um, other research showing that you need even more than that but every biofilm for every pathogen is a little bit different but 200 times the standard so if you're taking 200 milligrams of doxycycline a day so 200 twice a day you would have to multiply that by 200 and you'd be taking you know like 40,000 milligrams of doxycycline a day which is just ridiculous you can't do it so we have to come up with other ways to do this now these are some of the more these are some of the commonly um proposed um biofilm uh, treatments, right? So we have liposomal artemisinin, liposomal bio botanicals, particularly this is biocide in LSF and biocide and actually not in the liposome has been shown to penetrate this. In fact, biocide in, and cryptolepis, so biocide is an herbal combination product. Cryptolepis is a single herb that we're going to talk a bunch about, but those are the only two things that have been shown not to create Lyme cyst or biofilm forms and to be able to treat them. Everything else that's ever been studied has um, not completely eradicated Lyme and can lead to some of this formation. Now, it's better to treat, kill some of it than none of it, so we just have to be aware. And then one of the other things is everybody's saying, hey, there's a lot of fat, there's a bunch of fibrin, blah, blah, blah. Let's use some of these systemic enzymes to work. If you have a fat-digesting enzyme, it might work because there's a lot of fat in biofilms. But when you speak to researchers, who research Borrelia biofilms, there has never been any published evidence of fibrin in Borrelia biofilms. So all these sort of fibrinolytic enzymes, including some that are listed there, such as lumbar kinase, are helping our patients. But we don't really know why in a lot of cases. Some of the researchers are proposing um, platelet aggregation issues, so clotting issues associated with Lyme, you know, maybe that sort of functional or low level hypercoagulation type of thing, but there's no fibrin in the biofilm. So there's no, there's no debate that a, a good chunk of people do well on fibrinolytic enzymes in Lyme, but maybe they don't, maybe we should just put a big X on here because we don't really know. And so for me, a lot of the combination um, enzymes that I'm using, uh, if you don't have something like a long COVID type of situation where we would definitely want lumbrokinase, are more the um, enzymes that are going to be breaking down fat. So it's something that important to remember. And as I mentioned earlier, hey, we've got a whole bunch of different uh, or, uh, uh, research that does one study says one thing, the next says something different. So we've got Stevia uh, addresses biofilms in Dr. Shappy's work and Dr. Zhang's work, it didn't. In Mono Lauren in Gok's work in 2015 worked. In Dr. Zhang's work, it did not. There was an essential oil study from Dr. Zhang's uh, group showed oil of oregano, cinnamon, clove worked, but they're putting essential oils directly onto these things. Essential oils at the right dose, which would be essentially analogous to us dumping them directly on a Borrelia biofilm in a human would be toxic. So is it toxic just because it's the dose is ludicrous and it would harm humans or what? So we need to look at this again in more of a mammal model. But this is important to understand that despite the fact that we know things and certain people are saying stuff, stevia may or may not be a really good Borrelia biofilm agent. The other thing is we know that Dapsone may do this. Dr. Horowitz has done a lot of work on this. We'll be talking about this next week. Uh, Daptomycin um, intravenous, like I said, has had some evidence in petri dish studies that it can work, but not always the best. Disulfiram and then everyone's new favorite, everybody wants to get uh, azlocillin because somebody you know, wrote that it might work in a test tube. The, the, the honest answer is we don't know what it's doing to biofilms. 
In the case of disulfiram, also something we'll talk a lot about next time, we are seeing that it's helping in chronic Lyme patients. Is it because it's killing more Lyme, more persisters? We need to do more work on it. But certainly, um, just because, you know, clinical innovation is how all of medicine moves forward. Take the best evidence we have. We look at the patient in front of us. We add in our clinical experience and we come up with a plan. If we see it's not working, we change it. If we see it's working, let's keep doing it and let's investigate it further. So that's what I want to see. I just want to see more and more um, of this getting done and, and more evidence of, you know, uh, being produced so that we can really figure out what's working and what's not. One of the things I always love to um, uh, talk about is that um, the Borrelia, uh, a lot of the research talks about Borrelia um, and they're talking about growing and non-growing. And then you hear persister form. Then you hear stationary form. And then you hear round body and blah, blah, blah. So, and then we, then I introduce a new term, log growth or logarithmic. So think about active growing lime, active growing whatever, and we'll dive into this a little bit later. And then stationary is, is also persister. We can have a microcolony biofilm. We can have a round body or a cyst. We can have a planktonic spirochete. Planktonic spirochete is like um, basically under a microscope, it looks like a lime uh, spirochete, but it's not modal. And it's kind of like in a suspended animation, almost in a hibernation. And then we have cysts and blebs and other things that we need to... Um, you know, um, that, that did it, that, that are here that we don't even really know much about. Um, and, uh, so just, um, hopping over to the side of the chat for a second before I keep motoring forward. Yeah. A lot of these studies are on PubMed. Um, if, if, I mean, all the studies that I linked to are, are there, I think with the exception of one, um, but it's easily findable on the internet. Uh, I don't have all the references for you guys right now, but certainly I have them for our training program. So we can certainly start to, um, put a compendium together. Um, I think that's really important too, you know? Um, and one of the thing, um, I, you know, I, I'm going to make a general comment. If you don't like the evidence, it doesn't matter. You're entitled to your own opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. Now, that doesn't mean that other that we don't need better evidence. It doesn't mean that we don't need to um, learn more. But if you think about what 20% is out of the number of people who get Lyme, that's a minimum of 100,000 people per year. This crap has been going on since the 70s, minimum that we know of. So if you add up the number of people who are suffering potentially with chronic Lyme, and if you want to know some different numbers, look at the study um, that was published in, two, I think it was 2020, it might be 2019. It came out of Brown, pretty easy to find, and it, they looked at post-treatment Lyme syndrome, and they said in 2016, there was an estimated so many people with it, uh, and I talked about this in week one, I believe, um, but it definitely in one of the previous, uh, yeah, two weeks ago. Um, and then that they said is by the end of 2020, they were estimating a minimum of 1.9 million people with post-treatment Lyme syndrome. And my point, and what I'll talk about a little bit later tonight is that post-treatment Lyme syndrome, a large number of those people probably have chronic Lyme disease. We're having a hard time defining it and we have to get there, but that doesn't mean we don't treat people. But there are a gazillion people who get Lyme. There's a bunch of people who get Lyme who never get treated, who are sick for a little bit and get better. And we know this because we find out that they had Lyme and they never even knew it. You know, the thing is, we, the problem is if we start saying that we don't believe the evidence that's been published and peer reviewed, and then other people are looking at the evidence and they're interpreting it differently and making stuff up on their own. That just means we have two bunch, two sides of people who are arguing about opinion without standing behind the facts, right? And what, what do we know, right? What we know, let's take Borrelia miyamotoi as an example. We, we, don't, we never really even agreed on, you know, human infection until after 2010, right? I published two of the first 24 cases in the United States. They were within the uh, first 73 published cases of human infection in, in, in the world. But before then, we just told people it's in the Lyme tick. It's the same one that gives you Borrelia, uh, Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi. But Borrelia burgdorferi is transmitted, but Borrelia miyamotoi isn't. That was the best people knew. Then we found out that it, there was human infection. And then once we developed testing for it, 
then they went back and they said, wow, over the last like 25 years, 30 years, we missed over three, we have over 300 cases of stored blood samples where they might, they, we might've thought they had Lyme, but they didn't. And then unfortunately at that time, everybody's like, oh, it's on your head. But then we found out it was Borrelia miyamotoi. But just because they put their head in the sand doesn't mean we shouldn't. We shouldn't have to try to make the pendulum go so far to either side that we forget to focus on people who are suffering. We leave people out when we play on the fringes. It's really good for marketing. It's really good to scare people. It's really good to get people to buy something. But the bottom line is we need to start looking at people's health, or at least that's my opinion. I think when we come to the center and we look at all of it, we get to the end quicker. So that's why I'm so passionate about making sure that we're using the evidence. Now, in medicine, if you want to take it a bit deeper, is 2009, the Institute of Medicine said there's about 9% of what we do in medicine has excellent evidence. There's another um, like 10% that has decent evidence. The other 81% is art. And so they literally wrote that 81% of what we do in medicine is essentially made up. It's art. It's the best we can do. So I often will tell other doctors who are trying to tell me that, oh, well, you can't do this until you have more evidence of this. I'm like, well, what do you do in your medical practice, right? So that's to me, I'm going and looking at all the evidence and I'm using the evidence for what it is. It's evidence, it's a guide, right? And just because, and by no means am I saying that, you know, just because some people get better from Lyme and some don't, that nobody's suffering because we know that that's not accurate either. So. Diving back into these stationary forms, I think it's so important, right? I love using um, whatever works and I, whatever is relatively safe, right? And th what's really cool is this work out of Dr. Zhang's lab with Sunja Schweig and Jacob Leone, um, funded by the Global Lyme Alliance, looked at these herbs. And what's really crazy is cryptolepis, as you see, is the only herb or medication tested to completely eradicate the stationary form of Lyme in subculture. And the part about that that's important is it basically means they treated it, they treat and they treated it longer, they cleaned it all out, and then nothing grew back. There was nothing left over, just like we talk about tefenequin and atovaquone in Babesia duncani and microti. Nothing was left to grow back, whereas usually there's something that can. So this is really important. This is a, a really important herb. We've got Japanese knotweed here, polygam cuspidatum, scutellaria bicolensis, Chinese skullcap. Now here's some interesting stuff. How many people use black walnut hull or Juglans nigra for acute Lyme disease or just Lyme in general? Well, they found that stationary works for, but the non-growing formula, uh, the non-growing uh, one, um, excuse me, I'm, I'm saying this wrong. Stationary forms it works for, but not for the growing form. So it works on non-growing, but it doesn't work over here. I should probably edit that, make it look a little more clear. The bottom line is the logarithmic exponential actively growing Lyme, it doesn't work for. Artemisia nua, um, a lot of people know sweet annie or wormwood, doesn't work for growing, but it works for stationary. Cat's claw, Uncaria tomentosa, everybody uses this for Lyme. Not really good for growing according to this study, but it is good for um, stationary forms. So we need to know why it's working. I'm not saying they don't work, shouldn't use them in Lyme, I'm just saying you should know why they work and why you're using them. And the other thing is of all these herbs listed, they all outperform doxy and cefuroxime, something that uh, I think we should pay attention to. Uh, then a lot of these had little or zero activity against growing or non-growing, including some of our favorites, grapefruit seed extract, which everybody says hits the Lyme cyst, andrographis, which is probably more antiviral than anything, stevia, here we go, colloidal silver, the monolaurin here, you know, so monolaurin and stevia, we've got two different opinions in, lat, in studies, so we need to do more. And then the LL37 is a antimicrobial peptide usually used in the gut. Um, but they found that didn't work either. So as a highlight, remember, these don't work well for growing Borrelia, at least in this one study, but they're still great for the stationary form. So we can you know, just be aware of where they're working. As a reminder um, of what we're talking about here, uh, when we talk about Lyme and friends, we're typically talking about the diseases that are transmitted by the exoides scapularis tick, um, the adult female, and then the nymph. Right, very important because Lyme disease comes with friends. It doesn't come with Ehrlichia. It doesn't come with Rocky Mountain fever, uh, spotted fever. It doesn't come with tularemia, and it doesn't come with Coxiella burnetti or Q fever. I might have already said 
uh, or like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So anyway, um, when we look at this, we do find it comes with these other things. We don't really know what to do much with POAS and virus other than to keep you as healthy as possible. Um, but Borrelia miyamotoi, we treat a lot like Lyme. Anaplasmosis, um, we really need to treat acutely with something like a tetracycline like doxycycline. But then there's babesiosis. You'll notice that there's one big player that a lot of you may be like, oh, why, why is it missing? And that's Bartonella species. The reason Bartonella is not on here is this is the slide that says, what does everybody agree on? Now, we have studies in Connecticut and New York that show that uh, right here from Tokars in 2019, what you'll notice is there is zero Bartonella on there. Um, I will come back to that in just a second. But Borrelia species, about 56%. Anaplasma, that's about 10%. Borrelia miyamotoi, 5 These numbers are consistent over years and years and years. Babesia microti, eight and a half, uh, eight and a half for Babesia otocoilii. Challenge here is there's no Babesia duncani. That's because it's never been found on the East Coast genetically. Um, that doesn't mean that people don't get it. And because this genome was sequenced so recently, like 2016, a lot of our positive Babesia duncanis are probably Babesia something else, but we just didn't have the, t the right testing. So we're calling... So all the researchers I've talked to say, they're, you know, on the East Coast, we've never found Babesia duncani in a tick. Um, but when we get these people with Babesia duncani titers and we look at their blood sample, it's a Babesia, but we just need it to be, but we think it's a different kind of Babesia. So we got to figure out which one that is essentially. So they're not debating whether it's a Babesia or not, but it, it might be a different one. Otocolii has only been proven in humans twice. There are a couple labs, um, one in particular finding it often, but it needs to be um, further validated. I think those people probably have a Babesia because they're pretty easy to find on a blood smear if you know how to do it. But we, we got to be sure which one we're calling it. Um, the other thing I want to point out is Rickettsia burkneri. Uh, I Have you ever heard of this? There, I'm wondering if this is kind of a Borrelia miyamotoi type of situation where people are going, hey, uh, this is not a human pathogen, doesn't cause problems, but maybe it really does. This might be one of the, or a lot of rickettsial infections are sensitive to tetracyclines like anaplasma uh, and all the Borrelia. So maybe that's where we're getting rid of it. And then we've got this thing, like why do our antiparasitics work? Well, maybe the exoides scapularis nematode is getting killed, but we don't, I've never heard of anybody being infected with it or anybody looking. I don't even know how we would look. So, and then we have these other viruses. So there's a lot of stuff going on in these ticks. And, oops, and then if we go back here, um, I said Bartonella has not been found in ticks in Connecticut or New York, at least in the published studies. But Dr. Uh, Breitschwartz's lab said, hey, out of a nearly 1,000 uh, ticks sampled, they found it in only across the United States. They found it in about 2.5%. And Lyme disease is only about 14%. But the interesting part is, that's kind of a couple of patches all over the country. When they look at North Carolina, they're finding different Borrelia species, 63%. So Miyamotoi, Lyme disease, this Bacetii that they set up here. The other thing is they're finding Borrelia, or excuse me, Bartonella hensley in a much higher level, like essentially uh, just over four times the national average, if you will. So there's a regionality behind this, and this is important to remember. So we're going to move into um, Babesia here. And really, I'm going to highlight not the acute symptoms, not the stuff that everybody learns in medical school or you might read online, but these are the things that we're seeing in our office, people um, complaining of chronic symptoms. And some of the big ones are highlighted. So day or night sweats, air hunger, right? So air hunger is that like not being able to get a full, comfortable, deep breath in. Maybe your breath is shallow. Maybe it's just not satisfying, but you can't really even put a finger on it. Um, and then we look at like bone pain and rib pain because of the, you know, the blood being created in bone and, you know, this loving to be an intra, uh, loves to live in red cells. We think that that might be why that we're seeing bone pains in particular. And then we get these sharp shooting pains, which are commonly, people kind of describe them as deeper in the bones. These deep bone pain, sharp shooting pains are common. Headaches happen in a lot of these different infections. But babesiosis kind of has more of this head pressure around, you know, kind of like a band or a belt around your head. So that's just something to keep in mind that if you're having more of a, like a belt around your head that's getting tighter and tighter, that may be more like babesiosis.
we have a lot of the common things like muscle pain and joint pain, brain fog, numbness, tingling, all the same stuff you get with a lot of the other infections, uh, including uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. But when you get re acute, really un otherwise unexplained anxiety or depression that's really severe, that may be more likely to be babesiosis. If you get lower levels of anxiety and some other weird symptoms, you might be more likely to have Bartonella, and we're going to dive into that next. Um, I also highlighted dysautonomia. This is that the you know sort of the the dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So the automatic processes in your body, um, pupil constriction and dilation, salivation, um, you know things like digesting your food, your heart beating. Now. Um, Lyme likes to mess with the vagus nerve and you can get some rapid heart rates by uh, getting rid of some of the vagus nerve control over regulating the heart rate. And that can cause some issues. But Babesia tends to be kind of more related to things like POTS and uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and things like orthostatic hypotension. So that's a really important thing to consider as well. Uh, many of our common treatments uh, start with atovaquone and azithromycin. Um, and then sometimes we'll add trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Bactrim Receptra, because no one wants to say the other two words all day long. Um, sometimes we'll use malarone, which is the generic name is atovaquone proguanol, and we might add something like an azithromycin and a clarithromycin. Again, these are pretty standard doses with us keeping our um, azithromycin dose at the higher level. Uh, malarone is certainly something that can be started lower and worked your way up. So there's some room there. Clindamycin and quinine were used previously a lot for babesiosis. Clindamycin um, can uh, lead to a little more C. difficile diarrhea than we see with other antibiotics. So it can be used with caution. Quinine is terrible. It's got all kinds of nasty side effects. So I typically don't use that. Um, in fact, my entire career, I've prescribed it once um, to another doctor who asked for it. And I said, it's probably not a good idea. She called me back after one dose and said, don't ever put anybody on that. I was like, I know. Um, but a lot of times, even if it's an advanced case, we might use atovaquone, azithromycin, and clindamycin. So we can put all those together. Um, and then what we're going to be talking about next week is some emerging new kind of cutting edge and research-based treatments that have been shown uh, for babesiosis that have been shown to completely eradicate Babesia duncani and microti, not only in a Petri dish, but also in a mouse model. And that's one of the most exciting things, so stay tuned for that. There is evidence of possible resistance, so that's why we should use at least two drugs, if not more. And then the, everybody always asks, what's the duration of treatment? Well, if these things live in a red blood cell, um, and then uh, the red blood cell lives for 90 to 100 days. Maybe we want to treat it that long just in case. And when you're looking at a tovaquone, to get the full therapeutic levels, not the ones that make the parasites disappear out of the blood, but to get to a, a pharmacologic therapeutic level in your blood, it takes up to a month. So somewhere between 120 you know, and 150 days might be that duration that you want to consider treatment. The other thing to know is that the medicines I just told you about have never been shown, in fact, they've been shown not to work for Babesia duncani. So all of this stuff here, uh, at least the atovaquone azithromycin and the clindamycin quinine has been shown not to work for Babesia duncani. So you ran into a trouble there until Dr. Zhang's lab came out with this um, really sweet paper, again, with Jacob and Sunja, um, doing this amazing work, again, funded by Global Lyme Alliance, and they found that Chinese skullcap and cryptolepis had a pretty good effect against Babesia duncani. You'll see that knotweed and sweet annie or artemisia annua here were okay, but they're kind of in the 50s. I really like going for the, the big bang for your buck here. So we see that uh, cryptolepis and Chinese skullcap have now popped up in multiple different uh, lists. So this is really important. So some of the treatments out there, people are saying, hey, why don't you start with one of those atovaquone derivatives, add the artemisinin, maybe add this tefenaquin, and then maybe add azithromycin and some enzymes because you have to break down the, this, this, these fibrin uh, deposits that we found um, babesiosis in, which was only Babesia bovis in one dog brain. So um, don't know that that's in people, but maybe this is in this is actually fibrin, 
And maybe that's why some of our systemic enzymes are working because it's in Babesia. But it's so, it's like literally almost no evidence. So we definitely need to push the researchers to follow up on this. People who are promoting this style of approach, it's almost exclusively clinically based, the art of medicine, but it makes a lot of sense. So it, it's a way to think about it. So we'll talk more about evidence-based approaches that came out earlier this year next time, but this is stuff that's been talked about for years and people have been working with and seeing good clinical results. When we do a tovaquone, it's usually twice a day. We really need to take it with a fatty meal because its um, absorption is crappy. Uh, it, one study I, I uh, read, or I should say one drug database that looked at a bunch of studies showed 27% on its own, fatty meal, 47 to 49% absorption. So it, you pretty much can double the absorption of a tovaquone by taking it with fat. So that's important to consider. Um, also, if you're doing artemisinin, uh, whole leaf, I typically would use uh, Supreme Nutrition products, super pure, very inexpensive, but we're targeting 800 to 1,000 milligrams a day. If you use uh, Supreme Nutrition, I usually do 300 three times a day. And then you can also get a liposomal version. Studies really show, there's actually two studies on this showing that liposomal artemisinin is absorbed four to five times uh, better out of the gut than uh, standard artemisinin. Uh, so we can get away with, you know, if we want 800, we get the four. If we get closer to, if you have good absorption, you get closer to the thousand. And that's typically how we would do it. Artesunate has been used clinically very well. It's not really all that readily available in the United States and it costs a ton. So I don't really use it much or at all. Um, again, tofenaquin, something to be aware of. Um, check out our podcast with Dr. Ben Mamoon. We talk all about it for well over an hour, and then we're going to be diving into that next week as well and giving all the cliff notes so you don't have to spend a bunch of time learning about it. You'll just get the actionable parts. But the most important part here is tofenaquin plus atovaquone are really the only published things in mammal models that completely eradicate these things. Um, and again, more next time. Let's take a look at Bartonella for a moment. Um, there's a, if I go back for one sec, there's a huge conversation whether it's tick-borne or not. It may be tick-borne, it may not be in the United States. If you go to Europe, upwards of 70 some percent of the exoides ticks in Europe are infected with A. Bartonella species. There's evidence out of Europe where a tick infected with Bartonella can transmit it to a mouse. So there's definitely preliminary evidence that if it isn't a tick, it can be transmitted to a, at least a mouse. Right? And a mouse is used often um, as an analogous first step in figuring out if it could be transmitted to a human. The other thing is Bartonella is transmitted, or at least contained in spiders. It can be transmitted by fleas and flea bites. Uh, cats can also give it to you, and we often call it cat scratch or cat bite disease. But the problem is the big thing that's really happening at that point um, is that um, when all of this goes down, um, what we see is that it's not the cat with the Bartonella that's causing a problem for us. What's, what we're running into a problem with is that um, the cat has the fleas and the flea poop is getting put into you when you get bit or more likely scratched. So if your cat has Bartonella, it's really going to be hard for it to give you. If it has Bartonella and it has fleas, that's a different story. So a lot of people are testing their cat and trying to eradicate it in their cat. That's not how it's transmitted. If you want to know more about that, you can check out my podcast um, uh, with Dr. Ed Breitschwert, um, and he talks a lot about that, and he's one of the foremost experts in Bartonella in the world. Then we've got um, Bartonella symptoms. Like, what are the things that we see that are different than other things? You know, we see a lot of fatigue and decreased stamina. Some people have tremor and even transient focal muscle fasciculation. So there's a little bit of, you know, little muscles move over here, then they're up over here moving, and then they almost like migratory, where we talk about the migratory joint pain and numbness in Lyme, you can actually see migratory focal muscle fasciculation in Bartonella. And migratory peripheral neuropathy symptoms, I see a ton uh, with Bartonella. So I think it's really important to understand that if it's migratory numbness and tingling, maybe look a little more Bartonella than Lyme disease. There's an age-old argument, foot or heel pain or sole pain versus the heel. 
One's Lime, one's Bartonella. I have no idea. I don't know who made this up. No one's ever really studied it. Bottom line is if your feet and your heels hurt for no good reason, Lime and Bartonella might be part of the picture. And Bartonella is really, really, really um, uh, one of the ones that does seem to trigger alcohol intolerance across the board. So that's something to keep in, in mind. Contrasting this to babesiosis, mild to uh, uh, anxiety and depression are more the norm rather than severe. Um, again, these are acute things. They aren't, these are in people where we're not expecting it. We've got OCD type symptoms, right? Um, we've got rage. We can have acute personality changes and regression, especially in children. One-sided symptoms on the body, uh, like all on the right side or all on the left side. Something that makes me think more Bartonella than otherwise. Odd crap, sounds like Bartonella. Um, tick disorders, you know, like if somebody has like all of a sudden has like Tourette's or an eye blinking tick or a like blowing through their lips or flapping their fingers, it might be Bartonella. Um, and then there's pans and pandas. So infection triggered autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, so we have um, triggers this thing called pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, which is what pans is. And it's essentially saying the infection triggers autoimmunity, which leads to inflammation, and then it's a shit show. So it's really important to understand that Bartonella can look like this, and Bartonella can also cause it. So it can definitely lead, um, you know, to a false pot, uh, in, in, to um, a double whammy, if you will. And then I'm really fond of saying if you meet someone who needs an acute exorcism, whatever that means to you, you might want to be thinking about Bartonella. The other thing is we talked forever that Bartonella causes these stretch marks that are violaceous. They're purple, pink, and they're Bartonella. Well, the problem is, uh, especially if they're not in skin planes, right? They're not the normal skin folds and it's not associated with um, weight changes. The problem is we've never been able to prove it. Uh, there was a study uh, by Dr. Breitschwitz's lab that showed uh, what looked in immunohistochemically to be Bartonella in a lesion. They did DNA on it and they could not confirm it. Uh, but in Maluki in 2019 did find Bartonella in these lesions. Now, Bartonella in a lesion doesn't mean Bartonella caused a lesion, right? Dr. Charles Ray Jones told me all the time, like, if you have a kid with a brain uh, tumor where they've gone in and done surgical debridement and they've taken parts out and they go back in for more and you get a sample, Lyme can be found there. He said and he was an oncologist, a cancer specialist before Lyme. He said, equivocally, Lyme is not causing it. It's opportunistic and moving in. So we don't know for sure if it's being caused by Bartonella, but because in immunosuppressed people, we do know vasoproliferation, growth of new blood vessels from old ones can be done. A lot of people hypothesize this is the case. Um, the, imp the important part from my perspective is a lot of people who look like they have Bartonella for other reasons and can currently have these violaceous striae or tracts, um, then you treat them for their Bartonella and the reddish purple goes away and they go back to skin tone. Um, and that to me is definitely helping us understand that that's probably Bartonella. The other thing is these are, to be very clear, pearls from clinical practice. They've not been scientifically confirmed, but Bartonella striae, if they're actually going to be uh, vasoproliferative lesions, you should be able to push on the stretch mark, it would blanch, it would become more skin tone, and then the blood would flow back into it. So a lot of times when I was with Dr. Jones, what we would see, and I've seen this a lot in my clinical practice, but the middle would be red, pink, the tips would be this bright purpley red, really flaming, on, and you would push the tip and it would blanch, and the middle would not. You'd treat them for their Bartonella, and the tips would go back to skin tone, but the rest would not change color necessarily. Um, so some people goes all the way. Some people, you'll see that they have a stretch mark, maybe even from weight gain, and then it gets even worse. And it seems like Bartonella treatment fixes it. Bartonella also likes to cause swollen lymph nodes. So if you have somebody who's got like lymph, what we call lymphadenitis or painful lymph nodes, but they're not swollen, that's more likely Lyme disease. But if it's swollen or swollen and painful, think more Bartonella or Bartonella and Lyme. Then the other thing is we talk about subcutaneous nodules. That would be on the inner forearm, typically, and with the, th the thumb out and your arm to the side is the inner forearm anatomically. Um, and then on the outside of the thigh, people have found these. Um, are they Have they found Bartonella in them? No, but does it seem to be related to a Bartonella infection? Often it, it is. 
Treatment for Bartonella, especially cat scratch disease, is usually nothing um, by the conventional book. If you're going to treat, you'd use azithromycin, again, in those standard doses like a Z-Pack. Um, other things that can be used from a conventional perspective are chlorithromycin, rifampin, going back to the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and some of the fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin if someone's older and they're not worried about their tendons blowing up. Um, the problem with Bartonella versus a lot of other things is that when we do um, a sensitivity on it, so like if you, do, you get a urinary tract infection, you pee, they, send it, they say, oh, there's stuff in there, here's your antibiotic. They send it off to the lab and they test it. And they put different antibiotics on the bug that's growing. And it's really highly likely that if, it, if the sensitivity says that bug is sensitive to the antibiotic, that antibiotic is going to work. Um, but in Bartonella, that's all off. I mean, this stuff has been published in, in at least as early as 2004, if not sooner. So a lot of um, um, researchers and clinicians suggest that you need to use two antibiotics for serious infections. And then uh, Biswas in 2010 said, hey, they are finding that if you use azithromycin alone within as little as two generations, that's 10 to 12 hours Bartonella henselae can become resistant to it, um, to the azithromycin, and thereby, when it's gone, relapse. So there's a lot of evidence showing that not only serious infections, but even just any infection with Bartonella, we might want to treat a little more aggressively than standard, and we might want to use two or three intracellular antibiotics. Our, again, duration of treatment's unclear. We know that it's been published, high relapse rate if we use less than 15 days. The standard Z pack, you know, of azithromycin for five days would get you about 10 to 14 ish days. So maybe that counts as the 15, but not really. Um, if you have HIV and some side effects, um, which are those things we listed there, they recommend a minimum of three to four months, you know, and then what do we do? Well, I would suggest we treat them until they're symptom free. Dr. Jones always said, and then at least two more months without symptoms, just to be sure because of the persisters. And then we reassess once we stop. And uh, to get on a soapbox again, I'm really sick and tired of, hey, you're sick. We treated you. You got better. We took away the treatment. You got the exact same thing back. Now you have something new. When I was a resident, I remember one patient. We saw him in the hospital, had pneumonia, got it under control, put him on oral antibiotics, went home, feeling a lot better, finished their antibiotics. Two days later, same symptoms came back. I wanted to bring him in, reassess him, make sure I hadn't missed anything, go to my preceptor, and he goes, hey, you don't need, I said, I want to bring him in. They're like, why would you do that? I was like, well, he's sick again, and we already treated his pneumonia. He goes, well, did you? And he said, hey, you know what, um, what did he have before? I said, pneumonia. And, I, and, and, I, and he said, well, what happened? I go, we gave him antibiotics, he got better. And then what happened? Oh, well, he stopped the antibiotics, he got worse. He goes, Wait, what's he, what, what do you think he has? Like, probably just dies of pneumonia. He goes, exactly. Just put him on the same treatment for the same duration of time. If that doesn't work, double it. And if that doesn't work, then see him. And I'm like, can I do that with Lyme disease? And they're like, no, that's cured in three weeks, right? I wanted to like, what? But this is not like with remove it. Once you treat somebody and their symptoms get better and you remove the treatment that made it better, most of the medicine says if you remove that treatment and it comes back, it's not a new thing. It's the same thing. You just treat them with more or you combine something or you change what you did because it's probably not a likely, it's probably not a new unrelated illness. So why is this not applying in the realm of tick-borne and uh, co-infection type treatments? And Bartonella, even if it's not tick-borne in your area, why are we not treating it the way we treat all other infections? It makes no sense. And so one of the things I talked about earlier that I think is really important and we can talk about in Bartonella for good reason um, you get infected and it takes a little while to kick in. Then it starts growing super rapidly. But at some point it hits a stationary phase where it's got it, it's it's peed and pooped too much and it's used up all of its the nutrients that it can get, or at least the most it can um, quick enough, and then it dies. Problem is strep throat um, will burn out in five to seven days untreated because it reproduces 13,000 times a day. Bartonella and Babesia, we don't really know how much they reproduce in a mammal, but in a test tube, it's probably every five to six hours. Lyme disease in a test tube has been as short as every a couple of days. Most studies average out at about three weeks. So the problem with at least Bartonella and Lyme is that they're stationary 
phase is long and it may they may never get to this phase of death just on their own and so i put a gap in here because it's not like they're not like these quick things you know it's like they're more like tuberculosis and leprosy that need extended courses of treatment and even brucellosis um i put this in here this is like your standard logarithmically growing cell. And I put this in Bartonella because Babesia and Lyme look different. And this is more a Bart like a Bartonella cell. You don't have to understand any of this, except in the stationary phase, it looks different. Its RNA is changed. Its membrane is changed. Its fluidity is changed. There's a whole bunch of um, hibernating ribosomes. Ribosomes are stuck. Basically, it's metabolically hibernating. So they're different. And they look different under a microscope, but symptomatically, this is going to get it started. This is going to keep it going. But I also want to point out, I thought was the first time I could ever find it in this out there was in 2017 where someone drew a picture of it. That's insane to me. I mean, we're, so we don't know as much about persisters as we would really like, you know, and then we've heard a lot about things like methylene blue. Um, for Lyme disease, Bartonella in, in both stationary and stationary and biofoam forms. So uh, methylene blue is another one of these treatments that's become more common, right? Um, it is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, so you have to be careful with certain medicines. It's been suggested that uh, serotonin symptom ha uh, syndrome happens. It's reported commonly with IV use or at least not uncommonly uh, in IV use. We have not seen it with oral. Um, it does cause, it's a medical dye. It causes blue urine. It will stain the toilet and the carpet if uh, you have aberrant boys running around, but we just need to make sure you, if it's used, clean the toilet more. And dysuria is this um, pain with urination. Uh, I see it more in men. Dr. Horowitz has told me he sees it more in women. Um, and then also amphetamines, like a lot of our anti, um, ADHD medications, could lead to hypertensive crisis, so we might want to not do that. Um, but if we go back for a second, it only when you expose Lyme to it, it's only got about 40% residual, so it knocked out 60%, not too shabby. In combination with things like azithromycin and rifampin, it's been shown to you know, completely eradicate the stationary forms of Bartonella and, and also disrupt the biofilm, which is great. Um, it has great oral absorption, so we don't have to go to IV, and it, it reaches peak levels really quickly, and it readily crosses the blood-brain barrier. Everybody's always asking, oh, can I get it through the blood-brain barrier? I'm like, unless your diet's pristine and you have no stress in your life, your blood-brain barrier doesn't even work the way you think it does, but we do know that this medicine will cross pretty easily. We've seen clinically, it seems to be working great for air hunger and cognitive issues. My question is, is that because there's a couple of things. One could be it supports energy and the mitochondrial uh, respiratory chain. The other one is it was the world's first commercially available anti-malarial drug. And on the flip side, they tested it against many Babesias, including Babesia microti, and it did not work. But I haven't seen it tested against Babesia oticoilii or Babesia duncani. And those things, maybe it's working on those. And I'd like to see someone study that because that might be where we're seeing these improvements. Um, and the other thing is, I've been a fan of lower and lower doses, not higher doses. Now, next week, we're going to talk about some high do higher dose need of methylene blue and advanced protocols like to prevent side effects with things like Dapsone. But when you're using it in combination, say, with azithromycin for Bartonella, if you go too high, you actually can bypass its antioxidant properties and it won't, might not give you as much energy. And I've seen patients who do everything they can. They flare on everything. I said, let's stop it all. You've seen three different doctors so far and myself, and all we do is beat you up in a week or two or three, and you're not making any progress. Let's do five milligrams of methylene blue once a day. And we do it for like six months. About four months in, we, we introduce uh, red light therapy photo activation. Then maybe we go to 10 milligrams for another thing. I have one guy, 18 months, it took him to get to 10 milligrams a day. But then we were able to do double dose Dapsone and upwards of 150 milligrams of methylene blue. Prior to this, any herb or med that he used for more than three weeks, he would just shut down for four weeks. He'd have to stop everything, couldn't work. So low dose strategies can often work. The other thing we have for Bartonella that's been studied a little bit, um, 
is oral clotrimazole. Um, typically, it's an antifungal. A lot of people use it in the oral dissolvable pro, uh, form. I don't find it's, it works that well, and you have to take it four times a day. And in that form, it's said to have poor absorption. I typically put it in a sustained release capsule. And with the sustained release capsule, I do see it's probably getting much better oral absorption. And the way I know that is that we're getting elevated liver function tests or liver transaminases that we have to be careful of. And it's the number one reason I stopped clotrimazole is the liver functions go through the roof. So it's certainly getting absorbed systemically, at least in that sustained release form. That allows you to dose it twice a day, but it does seem to work really well in combination with other things for Bartonella. It also shines in yeast because it's antifungal. It works great. It's been published to work when someone has aflatoxins, which are a type of mold toxin. And it also seems to be pretty immune modulatory in pans and pandas. So a lot of our antifungals seem to be that way. Um, so just something, you know, hey, there, it's all clinical with the exception of, I mean, it, it is for thrush. It's for oral candida. And it's also been published for aflatoxins. And the, the uh, PANS thing is mostly my clinical observation. So again, let's come back and wrap things up for the lecture part tonight. But biofilms and stationary forms. Now let's look at Bartonella. It just so happens that a lot of the same herbs, cryptolepis, black uh, walnut hull, um, Japanese knotweed, scutellaria, multiple species, including the bicolensis, which is skullcap, Chinese skullcap, um, they're all working against the stationary forms of Bartonella hensley. So if we go to put it together, if we're using some medicines, maybe we can look at some basics, right? Um, there are many, many more, as you can tell from what we talked about in the beginning, but these are just things that have good penetration, work well, often underutilized. Um, and then you look at the herbs, right? It's like, wow, if I do cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, and Chinese skullcap, I can hit growing and non-growing Borrelia. I can hit Bartonella hensley stationary forms and biofilm forms, and I can hit the Babesia duncani. Has it been studied in my karate? No. We probably need to do that. Clinically, it seems to work, but we should work on it. Uh, you know, evidence-based herbs, including the ones up here for biofilms, some of our liposomal stuff, like liposomal biocide and LSF, uh, liposomal artemisinin. The whole idea here is it's fat, so we want to, it's like a Trojan horse, like you're pilling your dog, you know, put the dog's pill in some cheese, here you go. The idea is give the body primo fat. We know it absorbs out of the gut better. Hopefully, the biofilm is going to utilize some of that extra. That might be a fallacy, fictitious, uh, like a Hollywood animation in our brains, but they do seem to work a bit better um, in certain patients. Uh, even intermittent fasting um, and a ketogenic diet, I find, um, tends to blow people up if they have a huge biofilm load. They have a, a lot of Lyme symptoms. And, but if they get through it, they're so much better. And so a ketogenic diet may pref burn this because the body preferentially burns um, adipose tissue or fat. And when you look at the other side of it, it's creating rocket fuel for the brain. But the brain is literally the fattest organ of the body. So a ketogenic diet doesn't mess up the brain. It actually makes it work better. And so preferentially, it's creating ketones out of other fats, dietary and excess in the body, and it may work on this too. Again, it's something that's a, that can be very healthy for a lot of people. We need to study it more. I actually asked Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof um, executive guy who made Bulletproof Coffee and all this. He's all about super fat and being uh, uh, you know, on keto diet, diets and stuff. He's like, I don't even know how to study that. So we're working on it, but we don't know. And maybe enzymes as we talked. So I do have a little chart. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a second how to get it. Basically, I'm going to take our major herbs we highlighted. It's going to tell you if it works for growing or stationary forms or if we don't really know in a particular pathogen. But, I'm, you know, we have all the papers linked here and a little stuff here. If you want to grab a copy of that, just go over to originsofhealth.com at free resources. You'll get my top five supplements for healing chronic Lyme. And you've got your page right there that will have it, including a description of all the herbs, where you can get them, and then most importantly, how to take them and what they work for is all there. So you're going to get um, a version of this that you can download, and it'll all be right there. So I, that's uh, my thank you to you guys for joining me as part of this. And really in summary, like, hey, we got there's a whole bunch of stuff we know. There's a whole bunch we don't know. There's a lot of researchers on your side doing the things 
and are super important for the future of us understanding what's going down, the future of us getting people better, the future of us preventing Lyme better. Everybody's working on this. The problem is we're acting like we're not on the same team. And I will say there are some bad players out there. But I've also seen some of the previous quote unquote bad players see a crack and go, oh my God, the research is showing something different than what I've known my whole career. And they're open to exploring it. They're open to the possibility and they are starting to move too. So if we can all move towards the middle, that will help us with other people, right? That will help us treat our kids, treat our loved ones, treat ourselves better. We'll have better resource uh, availability. And you know, just before I hopped on, somebody sent me a thing um, in a thread on Medium, and this lady's going off about how all the labs are wrong, there's no evidence there, there's all these other things uh, going on, and they're, my problem is they are actually stating their opinion as fact, and they're saying everybody else's fact and opinion are just their opinion, and they use the word criminal. And I think the presenting... A, a, a single-sided viewpoint. In fact, if you want to know what's really great, back in the day at Mass General, um, they were very much against the concept of chronic Lyme. They were a little more open to post-treatment Lyme, but not chronic Lyme. Dr. Richard Horowitz was invited to give a grand rounds there, and they had to sign off on medical continuing education credits for it. The way that got done was the one of the residents said, there are more than one published opinion, and there are one, more than one side to this discussion of Lyme. Because medical residencies are funded by Medicare, they are mandated by law to show a combined, give uh, an overview at a minimum of all the treatment potential options and all the viewpoints. So because they were not doing, if they didn't do that, they would be in jeopardy of losing their Medicare funding and so what it turned out to be really cool that because of the way funding was done and someone just pointed out this thing, they were able to get that in there. And that started a change, right? And I'm so happy to report things like that because this is a long journey. We need to fast forward it. But we've seen advances through COVID in testing. Um, if you want to listen, learn more about that, listen to my podcast with Ed Breitschwert. Um, but it's really important to understand that there are actually more people probably on our team and the team of the the good and the right and healing people from what they have than there are against it. The problem is the people who are against these things are loud and have cash. So that's why we all want to get together. We want to share this video with other people. We want to come and have this conversation. And so in an effort to present you with even more of the evidence next week, and especially the evidence that's going to help a lot of people who are suffering next week, we're going to talk about cutting edge care. We're really going to dive into Dapsone, Disulfiram, a double quadruple or double, triple quadruple dose Dapsone, Pulse Dapsone. We're going to talk about um, uh, Tefenequin, Tefenequin and Atovaquone. And so that should be a little bit shorter than tonight in terms of the teaching part but really action-packed, and it's really helpful because there's so much research that shows that this stuff works, right? And then in week five, I mean, one of the hardest things to do is get over getting stuck and being sick. And I'm not talking about the mental state of it. I mean, outwardly and maybe inwardly, we're feeling the mental state, but this is a nervous system reflex protective mechanism that's causing a lot of what other people are saying it's in your head. The reason we talk about vagus nerve limbic and amygdala retraining and all this is we got to get out of that freeze state. So I'm going to share some really cool evidence that can help you heal and a couple of exercises and a healing experience that not only will help you personally, but you'll be able to teach it and share it with other people so they can do it. So really excited for those to come up as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let's kick back and get a little bit of uh, Q and a taken care of here. Super excited for that. Um, and thank you, everybody who hopped over to YouTube, because um, really what we need to do is just get hours watched. It's really kind of crazy. Um, I didn't know this before. Um, but when we do that, like I said, we're going to get out in front of more people. We'll get up in the algorithm so we can share this. And then we can actually go out there and start to hopefully get the evidence base that we're talking about kind of approved so that our channel can share this evidence with people, right? 
and we only need about 4,000 subscribers and we only need about 4,000 hours of watch. So uh, if you happen to turn this on and listen in the background, that could be, you know, uh, super helpful. Um, thanks so much for joining us from Australia too. That's often, that's awesome. I really appreciate that. Let me take a look over here at our other Q and a, um, polymicrobial biofoams. Um, there have been some found where you have like, uh, bacterial pathogens, um, and fungal pathogens, and there's more work being done. So we don't have a whole ton of stuff going down there, but we're getting, uh, closer with that. Um, so that's, uh, really, you know, pretty awesome. Uh, information on RN. Let's see here. Now, one of the things that we've been having fun with, somebody just gave me a big heart. So I'll, I figured out what that this is actually from my Macintosh, not from my Zoom, but big heart out to you. Turn it back on because that's amazing. Thank you. Um, you know, talk about that. You know, Bartonella is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of people say, hey, hey, it's like the worst of the worst. You know, my problem is you can get Bartonella without Lyme Babesia. A lot of my Lyme people have Babesia and man, it's, it knows how to hide. Right. And so if you look at the evidence, we don't know a lot about how to treat Bartonella, you know, to be totally frank, what we do know comes from the research on brucellosis. We know that if you treat it for six weeks with doxycycline, which is the standard of care, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of like a 40 to 50% relapse rate. If you do doxy and Bactrim, um, or doxy and rifampin for about 10 months, you still have almost 20% relapse rates. And we need to treat doxy, rifampin, bactrim for over 18 months to get under 5% relapse rates. So genetically, brucella and bartonella are very similar. And so they definitely look like in infections that are ones that are very much, um, you know, you know, kind of complicated. They can cause a lot of wacky symptoms. And the problem is they can cause a lot of symptoms that look like everything else and distract the hell out of things, right? So there, it's definitely, um, you know, in our training program, we spend so much time talking about Bartonella because it's a challenge, right? And even like the people, like I know people who study Lyme and Babesia, and like, I don't want to study Bartonella. It's so hard to study. And then I know people who study Bartonella, like, oh, Lyme's so hard to study. So it's like, People are out there doing it, but it is challenging. Um, uh, let's see. We had another question from almost an hour ago um, that was like, are spirochetes distracting or suspending immune system activity, um, but not depleting the immune system reserves? Or are they actually depleting factors of the immune system? You know, I know they can cloak, not sure. You know, it's interesting. Um, back in the day, there was some research where they actually found that uh, a spirochete could go into a red blo uh, white blood cell, corkscrew into it, roll around in it like a dog rolls around in poo, and come out. And under a microscope, looks like a spirochete. But if you look at all the stuff on the outside, it, its antibodies or antigens that were on its surface essentially look like a white blood cell to the immune system. So there is some evidence that Borrelia spirochetes may cloak themselves. Um, but the problem is, I think it's a combination of they're totally distracting the immune system because it can affect all over your body, multi-systemic. It goes to areas where they're weaker. Like, and I say in my case, like I had a weak right knee from some injuries. It went there first, but man, that left knee and that right shoulder and that left shoulder and that neck all came along for the ride. And it's like, so it's like, yeah, you've got something that's a mess and it's more of a mess, but now you're developing a mess somewhere where you never had a mess, you know? And certainly that's just one example of distraction, you know? Um, certainly suppressing the immune system, depleting the immune system, all of these things happen. And that's why when you look at protocols for Lyme, you see a lot of people who are um, on multiple antibiotics, multiple different medications, multiple different herbs. They're doing, we're changing their diet. We're making sure they're getting the rest. We're doing everything we can to hit Lyme from every perspective. It's because Lyme kind of confuses us. Like I think years and years and years ago, I was just like, one day I was just like, you know, the problem is Lyme disease takes a nuclear shit on your immune system. <laughs> you know, and I know it's probably not politically correct, but it's the truth, right? I mean, that's really one of the big challenges for me is that with Lyme, all bets are off. And you can just put Lyme in quotes and Babesia tends to do it. Now, Babesia is interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about it next week. But um, the researchers have said, hey, we can go infect the mouse with Babesia we can get rid of the parasites in the blood relatively rapidly with the tovaquone or tovaquone and azithromycin. Problem is, if we keep that mouse alive long enough, it comes back. 
And the other problem, probably more problematic, is we don't know where it hides yet. So if we, the, we have a lot more research to be done. And uh, amazing question. Um, there's a lot of questions that pop up about transmission of infections through breast milk. Lyme and Bartonella, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, all the time I spent with um, Dr. Charles Ray Jones, we did a lot of um, moms with kids and pregnant women. Uh, there's no evidence of transmission through breast milk. Lyme has been shown to be transmitted transplacentally, meaning from mom to unborn child. Uh, that's been documented very clearly. Bartonella has been shown to have that happen in at least one case. Uh, there is a question of horizontal transmission in both Lyme and Bartonella. There's a little stronger evidence in one case report in Bartonella, which is not really much. And there's a possibility in Lyme in one case report. Other than that, it's all substantial and anecdotal. We need more research because there's a lot of Lyme out there and it may not all be coming from tick bites, but at the moment, that's our the best mode of trans. That's what the evidence shows. Um, is anyone testing for leprosy in the Lyme community? <laughs> I don't see a lot of people doing that, but I actually have a podcast coming out. I um, actually think it's coming out. It might be coming out tomorrow. They might be delaying it a couple of days because of this replay, but um, coming out where I talked to Dr. Ebony Cornish about toxoplasmosis. So a lot of these things we're forgetting about. Um, the bad news and the good news about leprosy is we kind of know where people get it and where it lives. Um, and I think that, you know, we can, I think what Dr. Horowitz is doing is learning a lot from leprosy and the leprosy drugs, and that's why we're applying it to this. So if someone has a risk of travel, I've diagnosed people with chikungunya. I've had people from India come. Everybody's, oh, they have Lyme, they have Lyme, they have Lyme. I'm like, no, they have actual par gut parasites that we treat, and you see actual get the organism out because of where they lived. Um, this is a great question, I think. I haven't read the, I've read about half of it. I've heard many doctors speak highly about liposomal nanoparticle, micronized medicines, but do we know uh, with 100% certainty that the body knows how to fully process them and clear them out without an issue? Have heard conflicting opinions on this. Thanks so much for this question. This is spectacular. Um, the best evidence I know of is those two micro studies on mice where we get better absorption. To my knowledge, we haven't really dove into what the body really does with them for sure. We think, we're hoping it does something. Clinically, it looks like they do something. I mean, I know there's some study on, uh, like sort of in the non-Lyme world on these nanoparticle micronized stuff. Um, it's really exciting, but we need a lot more research, in my opinion, in that zone. And how do the, does the body know what to do with it? Really unclear. When our With our liposomal, Formulations that are available, like glutathione seems to work very much like IV, but the glutathione is, you know, a three-chain amino acid that's essentially bioidentical. Um, when we look at like biocide and that, that herbal blend, when we look at liposomal artemisinin and liposomal melatonin, the liposomal portion of it doesn't seem to lead to more side effects short-term or long-term than the medication by itself, and we have direct comparison of that. Um, I have had people use liposomal mabendazole. Um, it kind of works the same as mabendazole. Um, we've looked at things, you know, other medications, doxycycline. You know, I don't see it working any worse than the typical medicine, and I don't see side effects growing. But again, that's my clinical experience, right? Part of the reason that we don't hear a lot about um, liposomal or other variations on intravenous medicines, which because a lot of people ask me that, um, is with a with an oral medicine, you can change almost anything and you're almost going to be okay, right? I mean, with, within some degree of certainty. But you can literally change a molecule like an, uh, on an IV medicine and it goes from safe to deadly. So uh, when you're doing IV, it's a dramatically different um, situation, um, but we need a lot more on that. So great question. Thank you. Uh, is there any surgeries or operations where a doctor could check um, for Lyme or co-infections like a colonoscopy or other ones that come to mind? Um, another super question. Um, anytime you get tissue, you can check for anything, almost anything you want, including Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella. Um, colonoscopies, especially in people, like I wouldn't go trying to, if you have no GI symptoms and you're having a random colonoscopy, I don't know that I'd spend six or $700 trying to do biopsies for these on top of everything else, although you could. But we know in people with gastrointestinal symptoms and clinical symptoms of Lyme, 
there have been colonoscopies and uh, endoscopies done where biopsy proven Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella um, have been present. Uh, we know that people have had their gallbladder removed after having ceftriaxone and everybody says it's caused by gallbladder sludging due to ceftriaxone, but a lot of times they are riddled with spirochetes. So Lyme likes soft tissue. So if you're getting the skin biopsy, especially at the site of where you have previously had a rash, there's evidence to show that's a decent yield of tissue. If you're getting if you're getting your gallbladder removed, especially in relation to Lyme, I would certainly have it tested personally. Um, the GI tract can be done. One of the other places that's really interesting too is Lyme in the synovial membrane of the knee. So if somebody with a recurrently uh, swollen knee, that's a possibility as well um, to check there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jones had had some kids who were having brain biopsies and debridement from cancer have it tested, um, but it didn't really change what they were doing, and they already knew the kid had Lyme. So there are other soft tissue, but it, you know anything that's a soft tissue is pretty easy to, if you're getting it biopsied and that is an organ that has had symptoms, you could consider having that done. Um, uh, super great question. Um, is there any evidence that infrared or red light therapy kill bacteria and any strategies to help build the mitochondria um, that help build mitochondria can kill bacteria? So there's definitely, um, we do a lot of cleaning of the blood supply using methylene blue and photo activation and in red light. 660 nanometer light is really good for this. Also lower 900s, like 920, I believe. Uh, but that 660 nanometer is really good to activate methylene blue. You put those two together, antiviral, antifungal, it's anti-Ebola, anti-SARS-CoV-1, anti-HIV. If you have MRSA, methylene-resistant Staph aureus, it will then make, you know, it, methylene blue and red light together can go after that. Antiviral, antifungal, uh, I think I said antiviral a couple times, um, bacterial, really good there. Red light itself does have some evidence in certain concentrations and frequencies of being able to kill things. More importantly, both low-dose methylene blue by itself and red light therapy are really, really good for bringing down inflammation and optimizing um, the mitochondrial function. Methylene blue bypasses, if your respiratory uh, mitochondrial respiratory chain has five complexes, if one of the first two, one or two are dysfunctional, it'll start dropping electrons into three so you can start making energy while it's repairing one and two which is why a lot of my really sen I think a lot of my really sensitive people handle it. We slowly rebuild the mitochondria. Then the mitochondria not only give you energy, but they start promoting autophagy, this intracellular detoxification. Part of intracellular detoxification is also getting rid of intracellular pathogens. So we can kind of sneak in. And then the red light on top of that methylene blue can help with that. I'm going to, in, in, uh, in our fifth week in, you know, June 6th there, I'm going to show you some, uh, uh, techniques that you can do at home right away. You'll be able to experience in real time that promote autophagy. They're going to increase carbon dioxide levels, which are, you know, bring down anxiety levels, but they also vasodilate so we can open up the blood vessels, get better circulation, helps in Raynaud's, but it also helps get the toxins out and the nutrients in. It'll also increase nitric oxide, which does the same thing, anti-inflammatory, improves circulation. So we're going to give you a lot of uh, bang for your buck for that hour. So that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and then the red light is going to help, you know, um, I actually have my red light panel right here. <laughs> um, and I use it. And a lot of times what you'll do if you're with me, I'm trying to, I just got back from traveling, as you may know, uh, to help my mom. So I don't have it plugged in to the dock because it was traveling. Uh, let's see if I can get lucky. And a lot of times what you'll do is you'll see me like this in a meeting. And the reason I do that is even just this gentle red light on me is going to help support my mitochondria, my energy, help balance hormones. Uh, there's so many um, different approaches with red light that can help. So I definitely am a big fan there. Um, that one... If we use blood thinning herbs or meds, can it cause the co-infections to spread more easily through the body? I've not seen anybody um, study that. Uh, and the field uses um, blood thinning herbs and enzymes kind of a lot. Um, there is some evidence, um, uh, you know, about hypercoagulability. And Corson used to lecture a lot about this. Um, 
and we can, you know, sometimes we need to use heparin or we need to use high levels of lumbrokinase to thin out some of the hypercoagulability in these chronic infection states. And it seems to have helped, but some people blow up. And the question is, is it, you know, getting a biofilm? Is it getting a fibrin thing? Is it getting, what is it, what is the cause? And believe it or not, um, Borrelia researchers are actually looking into that. So um, that that's something that is important, you know, and the, the things are like looking into the, even these little nooks and crannies. I mean, there, there are so many in the human body. Um, the big question is like, what's a Herxheimer, right? So I'm, uh, and I think I have a couple of different opinions about, well, uh, there's different ways to think about that. And one of them is you just blew up too much stuff too fast. Some of it's you just did the right thing and others you're pushing too hard. So at the beginning of week five, we're going to be talking about how you, how, why that happens and how you might be able to figure out the differences. So I'll, I'll leave the rest of the answer to that one till then. Uh, yep. And all the replays of these will be on that YouTube link that we provided. Um, it's not going to be on this particular, it will be, let me see if I can pull it up for you. Um, I have it on some form, but maybe if I just go to the channel, the, the playlist ha is listed there. Um, and the playlist, we're just going to keep adding it to. So the Lyme Awareness Month 2024 mini series uh, is the one that you want to look for. And uh, let me see if I can go to it and get the actual playlist link. I have this somewhere for you guys, but I uh, since we were going right over, I didn't have it right at the tip of my fingers. I will drop it in the chat here on Zoom. If you're on YouTube, you're already in the right place. So that works perfectly well. Um, let's get this back over here. Um, yeah, and, and if you, you know, feel free to share this with everybody you can. I mean, if it's helpful, if you don't, if you find it's crap, then don't share it. <laughs> um, so let's see, am I saying many people who have Bartonella are getting that separately from other tick-borne illnesses they have? Um, absolutely, that is a possibility. Um, and I dive into this in that conversation with Ed Breitschwert. So if you're over on the YouTube channel uh, and you hit the podcast, it'll go and it'll just play the audio. You can also go over to Apple and Spotify and all that. Or if you want to watch a video of us chatting, it's just in the regular playlist. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the problem is you can get it from house spiders, cat uh, scratches and bites, fleas, lice. One of the most common times I see is like, I'll talk to teachers and they're going to see Oh, you know, we just had lice go through the classroom. I have a couple of kids with new ADHD, a couple of kids who just developed this weird, you know, grunting and they're acting out in class, their behavior is all great and so on and so forth. And it's like, the, the, you know, the whole class didn't, you know, it's either strep goes through the class or Bartonella goes through the class and triggers this PANS, pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. But it's not that they all went home and had fleas or whatever, or they got bitten by a tick or a cat was from the lice. So you can get Bartonella from a lot more places, right? Um, now, you could probably get it from a tick in a lot of places, depending upon where you travel to. New England, it's not really come through in the ticks, but we can currently see it. We can currently see it a lot. So that's a, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. So if you see somebody with Lyme, uh, with Bartonella and not Lyme and Babesia, definitely the history if they don't have a tick bite, but they had a cat, like um, the person who is typing the question said, you, you can certainly get that. You do not need Lyme and Babesia if you have Bartonella. And you also don't need Bartonella if you have Lyme and Babesia. If you have Babesia, you, cannot, you can get that from a tick bite without also concurrently getting Lyme. But in New England, depending upon the area, you are like 40 to 70% of the ticks in any given year uh, exoides uh, deer ticks are going to have Lyme and about, you know, eight and a half percent are going to have Babesia. And I've seen years in Connecticut where they've had as many as 90% of the deer ticks have Lyme and still right around eight to 10% have Babesia. So can you get Babesia without concurrently getting Lyme? It is possible. Is it likely? A lot less likely. So if you confirm Babesia, but you haven't confirmed Lyme or Lyme is on the borderline, you probably also have Lyme there. So we just think about that. Can long-term antibiotic use cause, cause uh, H. pylori and strep in the gut? I mean, strep is normal in the gut. So the problem with strep in the gut, typically when someone asks a question like that, is where it's overgrown. And so dysbiosis or that imbalance of that good, bad bacteria um, bounce can certainly happen uh, in response to um, 
prolonged antibiotic use. Uh, and you can see yeast overgrowth, you can see mycoplasma, you can see all kinds of different overgrowths from that. H. pylori um, it should not be coming from being on longer term antibiotics, but because of the lack of overall uh, gut health, that could potentially put you at risk of getting it a little more easily. Um, so, yeah, and it's interesting, you know, um, if after about nine months or so of antibiotic use and no symptom relief, would you switch to mold treatment and herbal therapy instead of continuing antibiotics? I, I wouldn't still be on antibiotics personally. Um, I like to do, I like to see change, right? Um, if I'm seeing maybe change, I've definitely gone eight, eight, 12, 10, you know, 10, 12 months if it's kind of like moving and it looks like it's about to start getting, you know, unstuck. But um, I usually use a lot of herbs up front um, and then layer in my antibiotics. I find it works faster. Um, there is no reason to not do the meds first, but the, the number one, um, I would say probably the number one criticism or at least up in the top three criticisms of the concept of chronic Lyme is open-ended treatments when people are not getting better. I see people argue about open-ended treatments when someone's getting better, but they never. But ultimately, they can't really argue that they agree the patient is getting better, even if they don't ag agree with what we're doing. I mean, I've even seen people at Connecticut Children's who are like, "I don't know what Moorcroft did. It's certainly working. Keep doing the azithromycin. I'm just telling you, you don't have Lyme. You have something else. Sure, whatever. But at least we see it's working. When it's not working, we have to look at why is it not working." And for me, one of the things I see a lot of it is kind of like why I left my red light thing on here um, is, you know, the, the big piece of it is that you, when we, you have to be improving to some degree. And if you're not, it's either we're not doing the right thing or maybe our body just doesn't have enough energy to do it. So I do a lot of bioenergetic scans. I'm going to tell you more about that uh, in two weeks to help lift up the body and get the energy flowing through the body. I use a lot of the red light. I use a lot of self-healing practices because these are the things that give you the strong foundation for the rest to work. I have a gentleman who's tried for three, four, five years between myself and other people to get moving. Not much has worked. I get, got him on a bioenergetic voice scan and within six weeks, everything has changed. So did that other stuff that we didn't do anything in the last four years or so work, uh, not work? No, it may have been working great, but we couldn't see the result because he's so chronically depleted. So we're going to talk a lot about that in two weeks. Um, but I, I definitely don't just keep doing antibiotics and in, in that aren't working. You know, if you plateau and then we have to change things around, I mean, all those things, um, you know, can be really helpful. Um, two, let's see. Do we, do we feel like we can strategically invite any of these infections out of hiding, so to speak? Uh, with things like heat or consuming certain foods. You know, I, I think there's a lot of talk about that and, and even cold plunges and cryotherapy to get things deeper. Um, a lot of what I feel about this is like, we don't know that they're really making them come out of hiding. I mean, you know, in order to kill something with heat, you have to have your core body temperature to 106 for a long period of time. And the problem is if you do it for um, roughly two hours and one second past two hours, you end up with permanent brain damage. So if you're looking at that extreme, you got to go to somebody who really knows what they're doing, but I don't know that we really have a lot of evidence it works. But and it, where I think that this is, is a great question is that I use a lot of these strategies not ne to help your body become less hospitable to the organism. So can I target Lyme versus Babesia? I don't know. I'd love to be able to do that. I'm sure people would love to too. But, and, and we might be able to get to targeted therapies like, you know, in the future, not too far off. It'd be cool. Um, but um, when we do things like intermittent fasting, when we do cold plunges, we promote mitochondrial energy production. We get rid of old dead ones or partially dead mitochondria that aren't just wasting energy and creating inflammation and not doing it. When we look on the other side, you know, um, of it, we got autophagy that gets that intracellular detoxification and pushes those toxins and the pathogens out of the cells. So if you want to know how to the best intracellular antibiotic ever, it's, or herb, it's uh, autophagy. It's your own body. We can get there through cold, less so by heat, proper exercise. We can get there. We can get there 
uh, through fasting and we can get there through breathing and intermittent hypoxemia. So, and a lot more on that in two weeks. So thanks for that question, Michael. That's great. Um, why is mold such a, why is mold such a problem when you have chronic Lyme? It's not easy to leave your home with it, right? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, a couple pieces here. Um, one is Lyme is often the straw that breaks the camel's back. And then everybody focuses on, on Lyme and not all the other stuff. Lyme is really good at causing a problem and chilling for a long period of time. So I look at it as chronic toxin overload, right? Got my cup. I'm the vessel. I can hold this much toxicity. If I'm down here and I get a mold hit, no big deal. I'm right here. I might not feel great, but at least I'm right there. But if I'm up here to begin with, you know, and then I get Lyme and it throws me over here and I treat Lyme down to here, I'm still having a problem. But what I might not have known before was that a half of my glass was actually from mold. So if I get rid of the half a glass of mold, now I'm down here with Lyme and I can start healing. So I look at it as, it's just what, what you get a trigger, but then the next part is, is the question, what happens long-term with that trigger? And so really your trigger is once the horse is out of the barn, everything can be a retrigger is a potential retrigger. So I think that's really important, and thanks for that question. So the other part is tons of homes in the Northeast have um, mold. What do we do? Well, um, I'll have to do some videos on this in the future, but the ERMI, the Environmental Rel Relative Mold Index, is a good helper. We consistently, mold experts have said, people with mold illness or mycotoxin illness, biotoxin illness can be exposed to a home that has an ERMI of two or less. And sometimes they need an ERMI of zero and rarely do they need an ERMI of negative one. So what the hell does that mean in English? When you have an ERMI of two, that means the environment that was tested, presumably your home in this example, has more wet mold species in it than 63% of the homes in the country tested. So that's not no mold, that's actually quite a bit of mold. If you need an ERMI of zero, it's 50-50. So you still have more wet mold than 50% of the homes in the country. And if you're minus uh, one, it's right around somewhere in the mid low to mid forties, right? So the thing is, it's the kind, I just look at things really basically because sometimes we over, we over complicate this. Uh, you have an ability to deal with crap and amount of crap you have to deal with. And if the amount of crap you have to deal with is more than your ability to deal with the crap, you feel like crap. I got two jobs, decrease the amount of crap you have to deal with and improve your ability to deal with the crap. So if I go back to the cup, I want to decrease the amount of stressors you have to deal with, the, the toxin load. But I also, when possible, I want to increase the size of the vessel. And so that's really how we get it done. So you can actually live in mold and get better. I know that that's like blasphemy to a lot of people, but I use a lot of photocatalytic air purifiers, which is blasphemy to less people, but still some people don't like it because it gets the mold out of the air. Throw it on, leave your house for a couple of days or a couple of hours, or just know you might feel bad for a day or two, but then it's out of the air and that's primarily how it's coming in your system. Um, so I would certainly treat mold and Lyme and Bartonella all concurrently, unless there's a reason that we would separate them. Um, a lot of times we pick what we think is the primary. And that's really the thing with working with someone like a lot of the people in our Lyme disease practitioner certification program is that they're working to improve their expertise and figuring out how to prioritize so that we're not just going down, da, 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 that we're hitting something bigger so that we can bring you down so you're starting to feel well. So it's um, definitely one of those things that I, you know, um, and if you have the chance to go to Mexico or Arizona for a week and take a break, right? Get the home remediated then. But it's a challenge, especially in the Northeast. So, but it's, it's really about, those co those combined factors. So regarding my comment about most of the treatments in that are prescribed in medicine have don't have uh, um, the you know all the evidence to back it up that we'd like. The chemical industry is very similar. A lot of uh, 20th century chemicals were just regarded as safe by the FDA, um, and there's no way that all those chemicals in use were tested. And the other ones that we said were safe, we were like, oh, now they're really not. You know, and then we took them off. You know, most of them have no studies done on them. Most likely never will since they're already approved. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that and reminding me it's not just in this field. You know, a lot of these things are people, these are businesses, you know, making money and, and as much as we like, I'm just always blown away 
Not that they would do this to somebody else, but these people will do this to their own family and they'll do it to themselves. I'm like, you are literally, you know, you're making money by, by toxifying and potentially killing your own family member. It just blows my mind. But, um, is there, will this newer information finally help us get out of disability? I think there's a lot of people are gonna be moving in a much more positive direction over the next several years. The best thing I can tell you is to do the very best you can today for yourself and keep doing a little, is whatever the best is, right? Tony Horton, the guy who made uh, P90X and stuff, he's just like, hey, do your best, forget the rest. Uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, who's a Teltec shaman who decided, um, who wrote the four agreements. Great book if you haven't read it. He says, always do your best. It's one of the four agreements. But, but he goes on to explain that your best is going to change day to day, you know, week to week, month to month. And it's going to change sometimes moment to moment, you know. So don't sell yourself short, but rest when you need to and keep doing things like we're going to do in week five. Um, learn to do these things. And then also get that, and we'll talk a bit about this in week five, but you know, it's so costly. So do the things that you can do at home, get your attitude dialed in, you know, and this is not a, a, a plug for saying people have bad attitudes. That's why they're sick. All I'm saying is if you focus on what you want, you know, neuroscience tells us what you think about, you bring about harness the power of the placebo on in your favor. It's just like, don't leave anything on the table, right? I mean, any little thing that can help, especially when they're free or minimal cost to be good. Um, because, you know, I remember that I was in medical school. I went in, I put $1,800 on a credit card the first day I even learned what chronic Lyme disease existed. And I think it took me over 10 years to pay it back. So the amount of interest on that was probably more than what it cost me. I was, thankfully I had, two grand on my credit card and they were stupid enough to give it to a, a doctor at the time who was negative $350,000 living on these loans, you know, thinking to make a difference. And, and I was fortunate, right? You know, I was in a position where I could do that. And because of the loan situation, I could let it ride for a bit of time, but it was challenging. And, and a lot of people are in a much worse situation. So that's why we try to do a lot of these free things, but also in getting out that new stuff, because I'd rather you learn about Tefenequin and learn about it and show your physician it and have them learn more about it and really know where should you spend that little bit that's left. Like don't dive off. So next week should be really cool. Um, especially with the Babesia treatments. Those are the, those are really great. You know, um, intestinal, is there any correlation between getting intestinal worms after doing a tick-borne infection? Um, we see it concurrently. I think the problem is, you know, everybody's saying everybody has a parasite. I think the biggest parasite is what Lyme does to your brain, to be honest with you. I mean, it changes the way your brain functions and it actually acts like a parasite and sucks the life out of you and sucks your, your willpower and gets you thinking that you can never get better and it's all Lyme. A lot of it's Lyme, but not all of it. And, and it's a shame because Lyme, if you look at healing, Lyme prevents you from recognizing um, the signals of cure, right? Or the signals of safety. So therefore you can't get to cure. So it, it can be a challenge. Um, and, but directly the answer to, you know, intestinal worms and spirochetes, no, but you're certainly more susceptible if you're chronically sick. Um, yeah. Thyroid nodules, should they be biopsied for Borrelia? Um, thyroid, uh, especially hyperthyroidism, autoimmune thyroiditis is very associated with Lyme disease. Um, depending upon what the nodules are and what the other symptoms are. Um, I haven't heard of biopsies being done regularly for that, but certainly would be something that I would consider if my patients asked me for that. Um, and I'd have to do a little bit more work. I don't remember seeing anybody actively biopsying a nodule. The nodules typically aren't felt to be that, but again, if they are, then, then it helps. The, the only big question at the end of that is going to be if there are spirochetes in there, did they cause the nodules or did they just move in? And I have not seen any research to help us figure that out one way or the other. Yeah, um, there's a question about what are the reasons a person's system shut down for four weeks after using herbs or three weeks after um, meds. Um, this particular gentleman that I was talking about was super toxic, you know, and he had no energetic reserves at all. Like anything that he did to stress his body, he would just collapse. Um, but the other part of the question was, was it about the cell danger response? And it, it, Certainly could be. If you don't finish one cycle out of the three main cycles in cell danger response, you can't really move on and finish the next one. We're all trying to 
go all over the place and cell danger response can help you kind of think about ways to um, kind of go around that, that, that pie, so to speak, and really, um, you know, heal one thing before moving on to the next. Um, but this guy was so energetically depleted. I mean, it was, it was just, uh, it was just pretty crazy to me. Um, you know, and let's see certain genes common from 23 and three that could be, um, uh, important to mind. Um, you know, um, I don't know that we know a lot about what genetics would relate to Lyme. I know that Intel DNX is, uh, Intel X DNA, um, is looking at that, looking at some literature, crossing things over. We've been talking about, can we make a Lyme panel that would help? What I do know is that there are a lot of, um, things out there that if you have certain genetics, you might just be more depleted than other people. Um, I would say across the board with genes, there's nothing that jumps out as like, oh, this is bad for Lyme. Um, but a lot of people end up on sulforaphane. Like we use uh, Avmacol um, as our sulforaphane source. Um, you see a lot of people on terastilbene and, and resveratrol when you do that. So a lot of our patients are already on those without even looking at their genetics. But when we look at the genetics, we're not at the point to say, anything specific for Lyme um, yet, but they're actually working on that. So I'll hopefully be reporting uh, back to y'all on that. Um, do IV treatments work everywhere in the body? Kind of depends on what uh, organ you're talking about and um, you know what medicine you're talking about, how they penetrate, where they penetrate. Um, can medicines get too concentrated? Certainly you could get stuff that's too concentrated in, um, in different areas. Um, whether or not like, you know, venous stasis or lymph lymphatic congestion worsens that, but there are certainly medicines that we like, even like vancomycin, I mean, we do peaks and troughs and we need to monitor how you're doing it. One, to make sure we get the highest, the right high level, but we don't get too high because it'll build up in different people and certain medicines, depending upon how they're excreted through your body, liver, kidneys or whatever, and what medical conditions you have, we may need to adjust for that. Um, Oh, where do I get my red light? I will see if I can find my red light uh, slide for you guys real quickly because we're approaching a long time here. And I will come back to that question in a moment. I think I just found the slide and I can drop the link there for you if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, we actually, I use... This is from one of my practitioner lectures. I just dropped the code in there and I can drop it in the chat on YouTube as well. Um, if I can get back to that one. And basically I use a Therisage Trilight panel. Um, there are a lot more, much more expensive ones. But um, what I like about this one is that you can wrap it. And I actually had um, a emergency dental procedure in December because uh, I cracked a tooth. And I actually took this part off. And the part I like about this versus the others is that I can actually take the neoprene off the one side and I actually wrapped it around me. And I was able to Velcro it and keep it on there so that I could um, sit there and get some extra healing done that way. Um, so I found that really helpful. And I have a lot of people, like instead of getting the metal panel, get this because it's, like I said, five times less expensive. But um, the other part is if your shoulder hurts, you can put it under your shirt and you can wrap the whole thing. You can wrap your neck. You can actually uh, wrap it around your knee. Uh, and then my favorite thing to do is actually stick it on the belly under my shirt and I wrap it on my belly because that way I get the microbiome. I get um, the solar plexus, which is the vagus drops into. Um, I get the entire GI tract. I get um, you know all the blood vessels down there. There's a lot of blood exposed, so it's a great easy way to get that done. Um, and that's the Therisage Trilight Panels. So that link over there will take you over there. They gave me a code for 10% off, so take advantage of it um, if you want one of these. Um, how do I know when meds aren't working? A lot of is, and how long do I wait to see some improvement? You know, um, you know, everybody's different. Um, I have a friend who says two months on this. If that doesn't work, go two months of that. If not, I go to IV. Um, you know, I, somewhere in the three to four month range, I want to see somebody making something that's more than just, I wonder if it's improvement. That may only be a small amount of improvement. So I often will have people 
tell me what percent of normal they feel like. I have them fill out a regular symptom questionnaire and I track this current and previous uh, frequency and severity of symptoms. So really, you know, we should be starting to see something happening in that two to three month range. Uh, certainly, depending upon what we find, uh, we might, you know, certain mold, mold protocols uh, or Lyme protocols, even in somebody who's really sensitive, we might expect it to take longer. But sometimes it's just I cause a Herxheimer at six weeks somebody gets a, back to their baseline and then at 12 weeks there's another Herxheimer and that's about it. You know, they get a flare for three, four, six days and they get back to baseline and they're getting frustrated and then four, six months in, they start to see the improvement. But if you're not starting to see some of that improvement over that time, start to think we might be depleted, might not have all the energy we need. And again, like I'll be sharing with you something in week five on how to get some bioenergetic scans that you can do at home and we can help you with um, to get that going and some other self-healing tips that'll help as well. Thoughts on dry fasting? Um, yeah, something <laughs> seems extreme, but someone wrote a book about it. Um, yeah, dry, to me, dry fasting is kind of intense. Um, all these things, you know, kind of make sense. Like I tell people all the time, like, hey, the sicker you are, the more likely you are you're going to have to be strict on a protocol and strict on your diet. The more the the more resilience you have in the body, the more you can do this. Uh, in in terms of like be lenient on your diet, you know, maybe not follow your protocol perfectly. But the other part I would say is that on the flip side, the sicker you are, the less extreme some of your will your uh, the less tolerance you may have for something more extreme. So from a fasting perspective, I would just start with intermittent fasting. If you're eating all the time, except when you're asleep, add an hour a day where you don't eat. So instead of seven and a half, eight hours of not eating, make it nine hours, work your way up to 12 hours of not eating. And you know some of the brain detoxification, glymphatic uh, drainage from the brain research shows as little as, um, 12 hours of fasting every other day can improve brain detoxification. That's not too hard, right? Um, you can even do that on a medication protocol. So where you have to, you know, be taking things two, three, four times a day. So um, that that's a part. Um, let's see. So, um, and, and so just slowly add into the more extreme. To me, number one thing you can do, I'll teach you in week five, but, you know, breathing slowly yeah, is going to do so many things for you. Um, Long-term antibiotics, conventional, even more so with IV is harder, harder on the body and the microbiome. I'm, IV antibiotics may not be as hard on the microbiome, but they certainly still, um, I've seen people get C. difficile on ceftriaxone IV. Um, I think the, you know, the thing is the microbiome can certainly be restored. The microbiome changes all the time too. I mean, you do a stool test every day in a week, you'll see different results, but you'll get a pattern. And that pattern over time is going to change. But your microbiome can certainly come back to a very high degree. There's actually a decent amount of evidence on that. But the thing is, with hundreds of billions of probiotic bacteria, you know, how do, how do we get like, you know, we're not, you know, the, the comments really like, we're not getting like a lot of different bacteria, you know, we're not able to replace all of that. For me, what the what our probiotics are doing are out competing some of the big bad things like, you know, I use Theralac from Master Supplements a lot. Dr. Horowitz taught me about them. It was like the first thing he told me to do. And then Saccharomyces boulardii, they outcompete C. difficile and yeast. But outside of that, most people who are taking probiotics or making probiotics are, are not under the fallacy that we're replacing the microbiome. We're pushing it a little bit more in the direction we want to see it living. Um, and there are certainly some better products. But yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of it is like what you need to do is... Um, get out there, get good foods, you know, get the inflammation down and then get in there with the right probiotics that minimize the risk of damage while you're on the antibiotics. And then afterwards, take them for a bit longer, but a lot of it's just going to be tincture of time and eating the right foods um, and, and bringing down that inflammation and the stress levels to, you know, believe it or not. Um, if someone is like overly uh, some people need a fecal microbiome transplant for recurrent C. difficile or some other really significant issues. Uh, Thanabiotic uh, makes a uh, essentially sterilized, filtered uh, human stool product, which is just shy of a full microbiome transplant that can really give you the prebiotics, the probiotics, and, and the postbiotics, or at least the seeds of that, if you will to regrow it. And so we do use a moderate amount of thanabiotic 
Um, I like it better when people are off of antibiotics. They give it to them for four to seven months, maybe a year, year and a half in a really bad situation. And then they're able to maintain it a lot on their own. So hopefully that helps. Can you test positive for Babesium bartonella on Igenix testing or anybody's testing and negative for Lyme? Absolutely. And part of the negative for Lyme is, you know, one, you might not have Lyme. The other one is, how are people interpreting that test? But you certainly can. Like I said earlier, it is definitely harder to get Babesia without concurrent Lyme, but you could get Bartonella um, without that for sure. Um, then the question is, what about testing uh, like every quarter or so after two year, uh, for two years and to see if the antibodies increase after, off of treatment? I don't, I don't personally recommend that. Um, and part of the, part of the issue that comes up really is um, that the um, treatment, um, when you, when you look at the, the, this, I just noticed I got a little distracted. I saw that link's not working. I'll get it to you in one, I'll find the other one and give it to you in one second. Um, thank you for pointing that. The problem with testing is we should only do it if there's, it's going to change our treatment or confirm our diagnosis. Our testing won't confirm it's gone. So if something's, if somebody's asymptomatic, I don't necessarily care if their antibodies are still high because they may stay forever. I know some doctors that treat all the time. I also, you know, and excuse me, that test all the time until you're all better. And if not, um, I also know other people who test once and as long as you're positive once, they don't care and they never test again. I don't agree with either one of those strategies, but I, I'm a little bit more towards the first strategy. I definitely want to see them going away, but we don't need to do that, you know, all the time. Um, there's a question about what is the likelihood of a false positive fish test at Igenix. I don't really believe, see uh, what I think are a lot of false positive direct tests. Um, now, things like DNA connections, I don't support. Like it, their, their primers are definitely not even remotely close to what I could consider validated um, based upon the way they get their results. But outside of that, Igenix, you know, Galaxy, you know, even MDL, these are some labs that are highly scrutinized for what they do. They have really good genetics and good primers, and RNA has looked at, you know, that organism, you know. So um, that's just, you know, um, something for me that I, I haven't really seen that be an issue. And thanks for that. I saw that question pop up somewhere a little while ago, and you reposted. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. And let me get you this link. I don't know. Oh, good. I don't know why my 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 link isn't working right. Um. It looks like the link works for me, but let me post my uh, link directly, and maybe that link will work. Um, YouTube's a little finicky sometimes. So let's see. Um, how do we make this part of continuing medical education credits and who decides? Well, the stuff that I offer um, for the physicians and uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners trained with us, I'm working on that. You need someone to review it and say it's good, and then they check you off. And the other thing is there's, there's a, a lot of these per residency programs and major hospitals. They have a department that does that. They have a person who signs off. Um, it's just about getting the right lectures in the right place, and we can do it. So people are actually working on that stuff. So um, hopefully uh, that will help. And let's see. We, we need to get more of that. And I, I'm personally working on it, and I know other people who are too. Um, yeah, how do we how do we convince doctors to look past just stopping at the diagnosis um, um, and at symptoms and look further for root cause? Well, uh, I'm going to keep doing stuff like this and shouting at the top of my lungs at any conference I go to and teaching people to to look because you know so many of us. Why were you susceptible to Lyme? Right? There's so many options there. So it's not to say you don't need to treat the Lyme, but treat the other stuff so that when you get to the end, you're doing great. You know. Um, I, there are IV uh, versions of artesianate and stuff. Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of action with that in the United States, so I can't really comment much on it because I don't have clinical experience. Oh, the new link works. Awesome. Um, what about uh, right at, uh, combo of doxy and uh, amoxicillin right out for a bite? No one's really studied it. Um, you know, we know that doxycycline, if it's given right away, works 100% of the time in mice if you give it to them for 19 days. So... Um, certainly I know people who do do combinations. I typically would do like an intracellular, like doxy or minocycline along with herbals. Um, and that tends to be more my practice pattern. Um, 
Uh, stevia actually can kill things in the microbiome, so that is something to be important to know about. Um, if we don't know, oh, well, the, so the question is, if we don't know the minimum rate of uh, a time for tick attachment that um, transmits Lyme, why do we come up with 24 to 36 hours? The if you look at an adult that feeds for five, typically five days, some reports say seven, in the first 24 hours, infection transmission is pretty well documented to be less than 5%. Um, a nymph will, and then by the time you get to day three, it's like 75% transmission rate and 90 plus in day four if they happen to be infected. The other thing is we know nymphs just shorten that to four days, so maybe you'll no, that's kind of where they came up with that. So it doesn't mean that no transmission happens less than 36 hours. It just means it's not as common. And unfortunately, what they said is it doesn't happen. So here's the reason that I'm a stickler on the evidence. I can show you the papers that show what I just said. We have case reports that prove that that statement is not correct, that it has to be you know, 24 to 36 hours. But that statement, if it was most usually, or there's, there's a low likelihood of transmission in less than 24 hours, that would be accurate. But the problem is we're saying there's no risk and that's a problem. Um, and yeah, somebody mentioned they didn't see the blinking in Zoom. Uh, I appreciate, yeah, I noticed that as we were going through and I didn't uh, say something, I did forget to turn back on Zoom. The beauty is we're live streaming it, so we'll be able to pull it off of YouTube um, and be able to um, take care of that as well. Um, so thank you. I almost, when I first um, when I first uh, saw that, I almost uh, you know I almost had a conniption fit. <laughs> um, there was a question, uh, but thank you, Michael, for looking out for me. I, I did notice it. I'm sorry I didn't mention anything earlier, but I, I truly appreciate that. Uh, somebody asked if Coats disease, which is this uh, rare sort of um, non-inheritable eye disease, um, but it messes up uh, blood vessels in the eye. Uh, typically behind the retina could be associated with Lyme. I have not heard of it being associated um, with Lyme disease. Um, so um, it may be, but, um, you know, there are more common things in Lyme and Bartonella that are in the eye, like uveitis and neuroretinitis with Bartonella that doctors very commonly know about. Um, there are a couple of cases of weird eye things which, where they did a biopsy, they essentially pulled out fluid from the vitreous, the fluid in the eye, and found Lyme in there. And they're like, oh, this person, we thought they had Lyme. Their blood tests were negative, but they had eye problems. So we just tested their eye fluid, and they actually found Lyme. And that's how they diagnosed them with systemic Lyme, was the only positive test was their eye. And, and like I said in previous things, we know there are researchers out there. There are actually companies out there who make lab tests who are standard normal labs that work with the FDA before pre-approval. They do all this big stuff. Like, you know, the people who sell their labs um, test regularly to like LabCorp, BioReference, Quest, and all those labs, they are, they understand this problem and they are working on it. So that's, that's really nice to know because it's just, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, there was a question earlier about um, ozone therapy. Is it legit? You know, there's a lot of conversation in Lyme and mold, whether or not ozone is something um, that could be helpful. There's not a lot of really good evidence on it in this field. Um, I know Neil Nathan says very commonly that it doesn't really work in mold, but it can work in Lyme. Um, you know, it's an oxidative therapy. It can certainly work in some things. Um, I had it when I got acute COVID before we even knew what the hell it was. Um, and I got to tell you, it kicked my ass for two days, but I got out of it super fast. Um, you know, um, I think there needs to be more evidence and work on ozone specifically in Lyme, but certainly I know a lot of people who are using it. Um, so that's important. Uh, yeah, it, I will certainly work on some sort of uh, compendium at some point for um, the papers. I know everybody's asking about the papers. Hey, uh, the la Ra Raphael knows, uh, you know, definitely knows um, where those papers are because he has access to them. I think this didn't get sent in the chat to Zoom. Um, so I, or yeah, to, to the Zoom people. So I, sorry about that. I thought it went through. Um, and then the pro, uh, pro, let's see, discount code just for anybody. It's on, we know it's working on, um, YouTube now, but here is just for anybody for the red light panel in the chat. Let me skim a couple more, but we are way over tonight. I thank you guys so much. Um, 
I use the mold air purifier I use is Airwise. Uh, put it in the chat here, and it's at water www.waterwise.com. Um, and so I will send that out because I see that in the questions. All right, let's see that. Um, yeah, so a great question on Bartonella, like, hey, it causes alcohol sensitivity. Does it mean that the person's more likely to become an alcoholic um, or they're just not likely to tolerate alcohol? It's typically a tolerance issue. Um, and uh, so it's not typically like you're going to become an alcoholic. So, um, uh, but the great question, because uh, I'll, I'll have to make sure when I talk about that in the future, we can take care of that. Um, yep. And then Ermes, thanks for covering that one. Um, I actually... For Hermes, believe it or not, I'm still like super old school. I, um, I actually use Mycometrics most commonly. And actually, um, my understanding about uh, real time is they're doing a, a slightly different test, um, but they do a great job with it. So, um, oh, <laughs> yeah, and thanks. I hope your mom's feeling better. Um, she must love having the, a great. Uh, son as a doc. That's nice. Thank you so very much. Um, so I think what we'll do is we have, uh, I think we covered all these. If I missed anything, bring them back uh, uh, next week. Oh, one last thing. Didn't you say keto was bringing them out of hiding and killing them? Um, I, If I said that, I don't know that that's an accurate statement. So I hope I didn't. Um, what I'm saying is a ketogenic diet may break down biofilms because they're very heavily laden with fat. Um, as part of their mechanism, their protective mechanism. Um, the reason I say that is I've seen a lot of people do a ketogenic diet and have a Herxheimer from hell, like a nuclear bomb was dropped. If they get through it and they stay keto, they tend to do a lot better and it's prolonged help. Challenge is the ketogenic diet creates like essentially rocket fuel for the brain and the brain is 60% fat. The rest of the body, like not only the dietary fat gets turned into ketones, but once you're in ketosis, you start to break down fat maybe a little bit faster than you would otherwise. So I, a theory could be that biofilms that are not positive biofilms, because the biofilms help keep good bacteria in your body and in your gut. These are things that are used all over by the good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria. But it doesn't seem like a ketogenic diet ruins the microbiome. If anything, it seems to help it. So somewhere in there, there's an intelligence of your body. And so the question is really, does that allow your body, um, uh, does the ketogenic diet and your body working together preferentially bake that, break down the bad biofilms? I don't know. Clinically, it looks like it may. I think we need a lot more research, but I don't think it's like making the bad guys come out. Um, so... Um, there you go. And then thanks, um, Sally, for looking that up and sharing with everybody because it's like they've got that. Um, and I'll put that over in YouTube as well. So anyway, guys, thank you so very much. Um, I appreciate you sticking around longer tonight. Um, I just had a little extra information, got a little mo super motivated today because there's just so much going on. There's so much crap being talked about out there. And I, I really like the comment. 100% information is powerful. You know, we we don't know everything we need to know, but you know, when we have the right information, when we know something, let's talk about it. And let's also be open to the fact that what we know today may change next week. And that's all. That's what I love about the truth. It, it's, it changes when we know more. But we have to be able to take a moment and focus on this is the best we know today. And this is what else we need to do. This is normal medicine. And, and I'm on a crusade to get the medical community to stop pretending that what we're doing in Lyme is any different than we do in anything else, cancer, hypertension. I mean, and in fact, in a lot of these other fields, we're lying about what we really know. We're misinterpreting things because Pfizer and Galaxo and all these other people are making a shitload of money on us. That's the, the way it is. So let's get there um, and let's figure out the you know, how all the, let's find a way to come together and do this. And I was surprised at a recent scientific meeting I went to where Moderna and Pfizer talking about their vaccines are actually really interested in what people believe. So I'm not saying whether I'm pro or anti any kind of treatment, including a vaccination. What I'm saying is these companies in, are trying to do it, something different rather than just shove it down our throats and I've not personally seen that before, and it's a really great thing. So I'm really going to be leveraging those relationships we created there to try to get this information out there um, and to get your quest. If I can get them on some lives, 
or at least a podcast where they can talk about things and kind of interact with the public. We're going to do that. And if we can't do that, we're at least going to get the information from you guys to them so that you can answer the questions, you know, before they just start to mandate all this crap. Um, because I think they know that this is consumer driven. And if that's the only reason they're listening to us, fine. Let's get the information. But what I do know is that I'm surprised they were open to it. My, uh, the friends that I made who are researchers, these people really do know and they care. And the Borreliosis researchers and the Bartonellosis research, these people are like, we don't know anywhere near as much as what we want to know. And what everybody's saying out there is crazy. And the beauty is their papers support that and they want to share the message. So we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I will see y'all um, next Wednesday. Um, that looks like it's going to be the 29th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we're going to do part two of our cutting edge treatments and dive into tefenoquin um, and dapsone and disulfiram. And I just saw a question about ivermectin. So I'm going to hit that next time because I know the person who's asked that question will likely be here. If not, we'll watch a recording. Everybody, lots of love. Thanks so much uh, for being here and sharing this with everyone. And I'll talk to you all soon. So that's a wrap on today's eye-opening session. You know, you're the heroes on the front line of your health, armed with knowledge and ready to win this battle against Lyme disease. And if this class gave you even one golden nugget of insight, consider subscribing to our channel. This is your go-to library for Lyme disease mastery and recovery. Your support means the world to me and it fuels this movement. We need voices like yours to spread the word. So leave a big thumbs up and in the comments, I'd love to know what your biggest takeaway from this class has been. What is that action step that you're gonna take because you attended tonight? And then make sure that you share this video far and wide so that others can benefit just the same way you have. Because every view, every comment, and every like takes us one step closer to a Lyme disease free world. So join us next week for another empowering session. So until then, keep up the momentum, keep learning, and keep taking action because together we are unstoppable. So stay awesome and all the best on your healing journey.